Welcome to the Hudson Valley Disc Golf Podcast. We got a lot of folks this week to talk about New York Team Challenge and the Stonewall Classic. Half of Team Mind Kill is here. We got Randy, Jamin, and Jason. They're here to go over their match with CPS. We got both sides of Jay Park Chatham Hill represented with Corey and Alex. From the Tower of Power against the North, we got Kevin Cronkey. And joining us for the first time, despite Corey's many protestations, we have from the Wilcox Widowmakers, John, JP, but not Josh Hafner, to talk about that, <laughs> their match with Saratoga. Thanks for coming on, John. Yeah, thanks for having me, Pat. Before we get to anything, do you prefer John or JP? Oh, whatever feels better for you. Uh, it's probably <laughs> half and half with all the disc golfers out there. So, oh, yeah. That answers my question there, because I was curious what, what more people call you. You can call me Josh if you want. I don't call him either of those words, I can tell you that. I've called him Josh more than John. <laughs> <laughs> that works. All right. Well, we may lose Jason before too long. So I wanted to start the night by talking about the 2024 Stonewall Classic, the first PDGA tournament ever held at the new Greenville course. Tournament director Jason Lasasso, assistant tournament director, but let's be honest, real tournament director Jessica Lasasso. Is there an actual course name for that, Jason, or is it just Greenville? Uh, right now, it's just Greenville. All right. So possibility of change or... Who knows? Yeah, just, yeah. Okay. I think that we're open to. We haven't come up with a better name yet. We have been naming the loops. So we finished the first loop, which is in the woods, and we call that the hidden forest loop. So that's holes five through thirteen. And the other loop that's kind of in progress. We have temp baskets right now, portable disc catcher sports, and just stone areas for tee pads. But we're calling that the meadow mountain or mountain meadow. One, of the, I forget which way it is, but it's the mountains and the meadows. So, and they combine to make the Stonewall Classic layout. Thank you. So the course is playable, but not yet complete. Why did you want to hold the tournament there this year? Yeah, I just want to start things going there. I feel like events can just kind of get more attention to a course. Not only did we get people playing it, but we were able to raise some money for the course. Pete Lundstedt was assistant TD2, and he had a raffle with like 50 prizes. Some of them 53, were, Jason. 53. 53. <laughs> <laughs> like a signed Isaac Robinson disc, put in a disc catcher traveler, all sorts of cool stuff in there. And he raised over $500 alone with that, which I'm very grateful for. Does he have a second career as a carnival barker? Because he was very good. <laughs> <laughs> he was very good. He's got a lot of experience. He does uh, the Forever Young tournament, and they've had some really big raffles and really success. So he's got some experience doing it. He's definitely got a talent for it. Really great guy and glad that he was able to help. He lives like right next to the course. So I'm really lucky that he kind of got involved in the course too and, and in the tournament. Was there anything before the tournament you wanted to get done that you weren't able to? The open field holes, the mountain meadow holes, they have short tees and long tees. And towards like the last month or two, I was really just prioritizing which tee made sense for the field that we had. And so most of them were short. We had some of the longer ones. But then also we had got that grant from Discap to put in Disc Catcher Pros. And so I was really hoping to have permanent baskets on all the holes that we played. And um, Innova is hung up. There's some back order. I've heard like different reasoning why, but no Disc Catcher Pros, which is very unfortunate because I think that would have improved the event. I like sports, but they're not even close to, to Disc Catcher Pros. And then also I have some of these, like, these weird situations where high school kids like to mess with the portable ones. They'll like take the tops off or they'll fill it with rocks or like just weird stuff. So the sooner I get permanent no one's in the less i gotta worry about that too one half of camel case Corey tim goyette got temporary basseted on the first hole and he was <laughs> <laughs> damn yeah there's definitely a different feel on the nines right now not only is it the baskets are different but the fact that the tees you go from like nice pavers that are flat and you have good traction and they're level you go from that to kind of like the temp tees we have which are just crushed stone on the ground in most cases with a little bit of rain i feel like the tee pads it would have been better if we had more time to get the pavers in but how do you think it went overall i think the event went really well the week leading up to it it looked like we were going to get rain and then each day closer to the event that forecast got worse and worse because i was watching it pretty much every day and then like the days before it i was checking a few times a day 
but it, it wasn't as bad as it looked. Uh, I think round one, we had a little bit of rain prior to the event. So the grass was wet. People got some wet feet, but not a lot of precipitation during the round. And then round two, we did get a couple um, spurts of, of uh, rain coming through, but not as bad as I was fearing. The biggest downfall to the tournament and the weather, in my opinion, was the mountains were not visible from the holes. And for those of people who have played it, like hole 17 is an amazing view of the Catskill Mountains, especially this time of year. Those mountains are just like gorgeous. They overlook the hole. There's a lot of holes that were designed to include the mountains in them. So hole one, hole three, hole 17. So none of those are visible, but uh, I guess the foliage was still pretty cool. And I think overall the course was playing pretty good. But yeah, I got a, some feedback forms out, got some pretty positive feedback so far. And uh, I said in my speech that, you know, this is one event that I really plan on growing in the future. And to start off small, it feels really good and looking forward to kind of just growing it. Well, in that players meeting, you, you compared the event to the first Mind Kill event, which also didn't fill. Was that the one in 2016? Yeah, I look back at that. I, th I thought there was 30 there, but there was actually more. There's like 54. But yeah, it didn't fill and it was pretty casual and pretty small. And I feel like Greenville has kind of the same vibes. And if I can grow Greenville, similar to Mindkill, I think um, it's got a lot of potential. Greenville is also two miles from our house where <laughs> Mindkill is, you know, it's almost an hour drive. It's like 50 minute drive for us. So to be able to do something that is right down the road, like I forgot my putters and we were just kind of planning this. Oh, I just drive home again if I need to. It's not like a big deal. Mm. You do that at mine kill and that's an hour and a half round trip. So it's not going to happen. But yeah, I can also bring equipment there. I can do a lot more things. And also the businesses I'm familiar with since we live in Greenville. I know all the restaurants. I know all the business owners. I know all the potential sponsors. Much different scenario than, than mine kill. I did play at that first mine kill. I played MA2 there as well. And I finished ninth. But this time I finished third in MA2. I'm just saying. <laughs> Almost a decade. That's some major growth. <laughs> yeah, I really did want to kind of win this event because... I never won mine kill and I feel like that's just not a possibility anymore. <laughs> so like <laughs> at least if this event grows, I'll have my name on something on a, some kind of legacy trophy. I believe you came in third that year, the first year of mine kill. Yeah. Uh, Chris Collette won it. Yep. Um, famous reality star now. <laughs> How so? He was on Married at First Sight. And oh, really? <laughs> yeah. He's one of the more talked about persons on that. Okay. You mentioned mine kill didn't fill. Now it's an A tier. Do you think this course has the potential down the line to host an A tier? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's actually some more benefits to it being in Greenville than mine kill. Again, like as far as sponsorships and like lodging and stuff that mine kill doesn't have, I think Greenville we could bring in. There's definitely some aspects of mine kill that are more favorable. Like it's a, a state park, so it's maintained all year round. I don't have to worry about changing layouts or fairways. So another downside to, to Greenville is they farm a lot of those holes during the summer. But yeah, I think it has potential to be A tier and I'm you know going to grow it slow and steady like we did mine kill and kind of just adapt. Right now, the layouts are very beginner friendly. They're like 900 raid layouts. We're trying to develop this golf in Greenville. I think getting like a good foothold and a good community around the course and the event is like the most important first step. Once you get a community built around it, then kind of let things grow naturally. Awesome. Well, I figured what I would do is uh, there's a few questions I have about the course, but I thought that I would give the results and then people talk about their rounds and then those questions might come up organically as far as like particular holes and such. I'll start at the lowest division for the results. MA4 Mixed Amateur 4 was won by Mike Pellet. MA3 Mixed Amateur 3 Highland Mike Warner, I believe. Let me mouse over. Yes. Righty. Righty. Right. Oh, there's the other Mike Warner's a lefty? Yeah. All right. Well, righty Highland Mike Warner won MA3 by four strokes over Robert Cohen. MA2 Mixed Amateur 2. I came in third. Did I mention that before? I don't know. <laughs> Podium. I'm not going to talk a lot about my round, but I never played with these guys before. Mark Bryan and Tim Goyette. Mark's been on a couple times. Tim Goyette knows more about the podcast than I do. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, uh, he, that guy's got a memory. Yeah, that's he what he was saying. He, it, he he was remembering stuff that I'm like, no, no, I got nothing. And Mark Ryan taught me that my disc golf shit talking is rusty. Basically, Mark Bryan is banned from the podcast for one week for every old joke he made about me. So you might hear from him in like 2029 at best. <laughs> 
but it was fun. It was it was one of the more fun rounds in miserable conditions that I've had. And when I say miserable condition, I'm talking about the weather. I thought the course was great. Half of those holes are a little out of my reach, at least at this point, but it was fun. Uh, and Mark and Tim battled really till the end. And it got hairy at the end with the rain because that's when it really, it was a slight drizzle, it seemed like, most of the day. And then near the end, it started coming down a little more consistently. Mm-hmm. And for me, my 200-foot bombs were dre- were down to like, 75 to 100 at that point because i'm doing all four hands and they're just slipping and i'm like i'm not winning nothing i'm barely drying them off i probably would have had a better shot doing like uh heiser bombs but mark bryan we'll hear from you in 2029 ma60 mixed amateur 60 that was a barn burner kevin how'd that go dave jacob played a wonderful game and i took a long walk in the woods and the rain had you played that course before? I had not. I had hoped to get there. Actually, I reached out to Jess like the weekend of the Greenville Festival. And she's like, yeah, it'd probably be all right, but parking might be hard. So then Silvano and I just decided that, well, we just play blind. Well, I think he's played it, but I just moved on to other things at that point in time. So had not played it. I'm not sure it would have helped yesterday. Mm. Just chuck it up to one of those days. What did you like about the course? I mean, the scenery is phenomenal. The stone walls, walking through some of those trails, you know, some of those longer little hikes. It, I thought it was phenomenal. Great tree scenery, the foliage and everything. I think, you know, that time of the year, that's that place is going to gonna be gorgeous. Is gorgeous. Hmm. What did you not like about it? Some of the long walks, <laughs> some of the long holes. This guy likes the walks. He doesn't like the walks. Okay, he's <laughs> I like seeing the walks, Corey. You know, <laughs> I do remember at one point telling those guys, "I'm like, you know, I don't mind a, walking a long distance if I'm going after a disc. Of course, I'm only walking 200 feet at a time, anyway. So that's I'm about that." <laughs> <laughs> What was your favorite hole? There's a couple of holes that reminded me of some holes from Wallace. So I'd probably say them. I think it's a tunnel shot, kind of almost a straight down, but like a tunnel shot right down a bunch of nice big trees. Maybe it was, is that in the woods? No, it's a straight shot, right? It's not a very far shot, but it's Yeah, very no, low. it's like a 200, like a 200 yeah. footer or something, maybe even, you know? In the second round, I almost wanted to get on my knees on the tee pad and forehand it. I don't think I could have reached it, but I think I could have got like to where I had a putt. Yeah. The ceiling's just low enough that it freaked me out both times. So probably one of those. I'm horrible at like retaining those thoughts. I come back from a round and listen to all you guys talking about your round and you did this shot. And I'm like, oh man, I can't remember what, where did I finish? Jason, what was that hold? I think it was 12. I think it's all 12, yeah. Pat's talking about 12. I'm not sure if Kevin was talking about the same hole or not. He said it was downhill. That hole 12 is not downhill. 12 is the one I'm thinking of. It wasn't downhill. It was kind of hobbity. There were a couple of holes, right, where there's a downhill slope, short run. Yeah, lots of elevation. Yeah, lots of elevation rise off a lot of elevation drop. Those were kind of fun, too. Real quick, Jason, since we're on 12, 13 is that little hyzer bomb type of shot, right? Yep. And I don't know if this is something in the future, because I saw those two flags. Is it the potential for, like, uh, you got to go over the rock wall or that's the drop zone? Or was that just flagged for safety reasons? That was um, actually a junior tee, because that hole in the summertime gets really thick on the left and the right. And when we play casual rounds with kids, they have a tendency of throwing their discs into the pretty nasty rough. Mm. So we put those junior tees in just for people that can't throw farther than, say, 80 to 90 feet. Kids or me, when I'm thinking that, I got to get over that <laughs> rock wall. Yeah. We did check it after the fact, but yeah. You yeah, the funny only one. story. First round, I hit, like, first available on that hole. Probably my worst tee shot of that round. And I immediately asked, do I have to re-tee? Is there a drop zone? And uh, the rest of my card pretty much said, uh... It's not OB. I wouldn't recommend reteeing. And uh, it was a pretty crappy lie, but it, that fooled me for a little bit there. Oh, I was thinking it was like OB? Yeah, I was playing blind also. So uh, I, I had read the course notes, but, you know, some stuff goes over your head. And yeah, I saw the stakes and thought, oh, no, I just threw it out of bounds. Oh, yeah, I could see that. There's a lot of Stonewall OBs, and that one is one of the few that's not. So, yeah. I mean, but also reteeing wouldn't have been like the worst idea either. <laughs> okay. I bogeyed it. <laughs> I, yeah. You, I mean, you could have bogeyed it with a retee too. I could have parted it with a retee, but. <laughs> <That's cruel. laughs> While we're on those holes, what's it, 17? The one where you have a bit of a trek? 
to it over the cow hill. Yeah, I apologize for those long walks. They're not permanent. So I figured it was like Jason found this really cool thing. And from listening to you and Jamin talk about course building, it's like there's a purpose to the walk. So I'm not in no way am I complaining about the walk. Of course, it doesn't sound like it because I sound like I'm complaining about everything. But my question was, are there plans to maybe put holes in between? Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you notice the numbering was a little funky after hole 13, there was that T1, which is like a temporary mm-hmm. hole, because that is not part of the permanent layout, that wide open one. And that long walk to hole 14, but it was hole 15 in the layout, that long walk is actually going to disappear too, because there's another hole between what's now hole 13 and 14. But that long big field that you guys walk over to get to hole 17 that's actually a designed par five it's the longest hole on the course and it'll eventually play down to there's a big pond it's it's gonna be really epic hole but it's it's not even close to being ready and even like the preliminary short t version of it wasn't ready and looking at the field we had i was like i was a little worried about daylight and stuff like that i was like we're not even gonna try to play this par five it wouldn't have been appropriate for the field we had Mm. So does that mean some holes are just going to disappear, be combined, or they're just going to be more than 18? There'll be 18. So hole 11 will actually be a par four that plays to 13. So hole 11 is like the first one in the woods. It's more flat where you throw onto a stonewall island. If you keep going down that path, it actually goes into 13's fairway. So that's a par four. And then you'll play 12 as 12. Then there's going to be a new hole 13. It's in the woods that basically connects 12 and 14. Right now, there's like a marksman dynamic disc basket out there. And the fairway didn't feel ready enough. So I went with a temporary hole out in the field. Kind of just a decision to not play a hole that wasn't ready. And then so combining those holes and adding that is a net zero. And then instead of the temp hole, that open field one, it'll be the par five hole 16. That temp hole is the worst thing you can do with me in disc golf. And I probably mentioned it 47 times on this podcast, like a basket in the open field with nothing in front of you. <laughs> I hyzered out every freaking time. So, uh, and then the second shot, I was afraid to overthrow it. Actually, first round, I underthrew it. Second round, I overthrew it and uh, bogeyed it both times. But the one with the, the rocks, the, the OB one. Oh, 15 with like the slope that goes up? Yeah, where you start OB and you have to throw it into the island of rocks. Yeah, I think that hole has a ton of potential. It's the farthest one from like the pavilion and everything else. So it's been the last one to be worked on because we've kind of been working our way out. So that one definitely needs the most TLC in the future. But I think that hole actually has like insane potential being with those two giant stone walls on each side. And once that gets cleaned up, that'll be a really good hole. Anybody have any comments on that one? I mean, I love that hole. I eagled it the first round. Mm hmm. Yeah, the feedback I've got so far, like nobody nobody said they hated it, but people have told me that. And the feedback that was listed as people's favorite hole multiple times, which I was surprised about. I didn't expect it to be like people's favorite, but um, I guess it was a lot different than the other holes we played because it just was so technically tight with all those little trees in it that need to come out. But. Yeah. And that's the thing about it. I think Tim threw a really great shot and the whole way I'm like, a little bit to the left. If that hits any tree, it has the potential to be an OB shot. That makes it kind of fun. You and I have different definitions of fun there. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 175. It's a pill. So it's it's reachable for most people if they hit the line right. I went OB the second round, so I know how that feels. But that was also the one I used for the all division AMCTP to win a disc catcher traveler basket because they figured it would be the most random person gets the ctp on that yeah well i took a seven in the first round i went ob twice but the second round i I got a par so which in the first round would have been a birdie until the end of the round yeah because the par kind of (laughs) changed yeah there were some eagles in the that turned into birdies yeah but no i I thought that was great like i said there was a bit of a walk to it but uh, and that's the one i don't know if we miscommunicated earlier because i kept calling it 17 but there's plans to have holes leading up to that one in the future yeah so that long walk after the temp one to there goes parallel to the fairway of a hole that is getting broken in right now. And then we actually have plans to add even more wooded holes because in the summertime, when some of the field holes become unavailable, we want to keep an 18 hole layout in the woods too. So there's actually plans for a lot more holes in the woods. But for the main 18 that we'll use for tournaments, that one is going to be integral into that 18 hole loop. MA40 Mixed Amateur 40. That was Jared Secor by seven strokes over Evan Artiga. And Evan Parsley came in third. 
But he did point out that he had his shoes on the whole round and he played every hole correctly. I can't verify that. Which is crazy because I'm pretty sure his feet were probably wetter walking through <laughs> all that grass and they would have gotten had he, <laughs> uh, had he gone into that water at CTK. Or he did go into that water, right, right. Mm. Uh, you know what I was trying to say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Everybody's feet look like prunes after those rounds, I'm sure. FA1 Women's Amateur 1, Kareen Carey won that. And Nicholas Cardone took down MA1 with a plus two. In the MPO division... Corey, how'd you do? A little wishy-washy before Sunday. Was that a rain joke? Uh, well, kind of, yeah, <laughs> I suppose. I didn't even realize it was supposed to be raining. Like, I didn't look that far ahead into my week. I know I had Team Challenge on Saturday. I wasn't even thinking about Sunday until during Team Challenge, Justin Uccelli were talking, and he was, like, you know, talking about the rainy round we're going to have on Sunday. I didn't think it was going to rain until I saw Randy sent a message in our chat saying, checklist for Stonewall, raincoat, umbrella, the X Destroyer, and a beer. So. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah so like same thing i woke up in the morning after staying up too late not getting enough sleep and then trying to pack all my stuff i'm like okay well i guess i'll wear pants and it's gonna be 40 degrees i want to wear a hoodie and sweatpants but not in the rain i'll just be a soaking wet mess and freezing so i wore like pants i never wear a rain jacket that's not even a rain jacket it's more of a windbreaker so if it actually is raining that thing just gets drenched too pack all my stuff for some reason i didn't wear different shoes to the course i like just wore my disc golf shoes so like during lunch and after the round i could not change into other shoes and dry socks get all my stuff together get down to the course and realize i forgot an umbrella so <laughs> luckily uh the los assos had an extra umbrella i could use but yeah round one didn't actually even need the umbrella i played okay i was playing clean wasn't really getting any bogeys i was putting well the course at least for like a, a third of the course is like wide open and probably half of those holes i just need like i need 20 feet more of like comfortable distance per throw to actually birdie them hmm. so on basically all the open holes i'm just trying to get pars except for one maybe two of them but yeah i played through the whole round and didn't get a single bogey until hole 18 which was our second to last hole and i double bogeyed it because i threw a drive that i thought might have been ob it wasn't decided to then try to throw over the ob and get a lot of distance and clipped a tree that is ob and landed ob <laughs> so i didn't even go ob up to drive go up We'll be on my second shot. End up taking a six, which kind of disappointed myself because I feel like in true Corey fashion, I'll have a good round going and I'll play one hole badly and it erases half the work I did. Yeah, if I have to both rounds. Same. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so you got me on that one. <laughs> Tim Goya, he must have landed like 10 feet on the close side of OB. Like he didn't get across it, but he hit one of the two or three little things that go up over six feet. He had just a bush to get around and he ended up having to just throw like a kind of a weak forehand because there's nothing else he could do. It basically cost him a stroke on the hole. It's 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 I like it. It, it was interesting. Yeah, that's all I should have did. Now that I think about it, I don't know why I didn't try to do like a choppy forehand, but I'm like, oh, either I could like tomahawk over this thing and, and easily clear it, but only, you know, not get. I'm just going to birdie from there anyways, so I don't know why mm. I didn't just do that, but I decided to do this <laughs> stupid backhand high release like Anheuser, and it was just dog shit. It was so bad. I was so frustrated with myself. So I moped for half a hole in front of Danny Parton <laughs> and Randy and Hafner, and then eventually got over it, I guess. But um, yeah, so round two, it actually did rain a bit, which wasn't too bad, but... Uh, there was definitely a couple holes where the slickness got to me and I definitely duffed like a 70 foot drive just from throwing it right into the ground at least once. But I didn't take any bogeys round two. I had some really, really good par save, which I was pretty happy with and kind of continued my good putting. But I kind of already figured that with low registration numbers and like a brand new course that ratings weren't going to be that great, but um, they ended up being fine. I mean, people definitely improved the second round, even in the, the worst weather, just because most people are playing it blind. But I was hoping after round one to at least... You know, get a podium finish and take a little bit of cash. But as I'm sure we'll hear all about, Hafner Lee <laughs> fucked me, <laughs> even though he wasn't the only one. Actually, wait, Randy, how did you do first round? Oh, no, we were tied, right? You were tied. We were yeah. tied first round. So I wasn't really worried about Randy at all. And I definitely wasn't worried about Hafner. <laughs> even though the last time I practiced the course, 
Randy beat me by like 10 strokes. Yeah, and then uh, Jason kind of mentioned it, but my participation in the raffle, I decided that, oh, there's 50 plus prizes and like 25 people. 53. Here, like, 53, 53 prizes <laughs> and 20-something people. I had a pretty good chance. I'm like, yeah, I'll toss 20 bucks in. I was able to get a fresh new hat and a color that most people don't really wear hats in so I could stand out a little bit more. Can you put a mini in that hat, though? And no, but it did come with a bottle opener, like a uh, hook to the back strap, which I'm sure was just for packaging. But I might actually make that part of the hat. Like, I'm just going to keep this bottle opener in the back of my hat swinging around. Is that going to replace the mini hat? Mm. It depends. Is it a casual round or is it a tournament round where I actually need to use a mini? Could you use the bottle opener as a mini? No. Mm. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, I guess no. Let's consult our local rule Nazi expert. Jamin, is that legal? <laughs> There's a weird PDF that if you go to like three PDGA pages, link after link, you can download this. It's like a paragraph and it details what is legal to use as a mini disc. It has a diameter and then some thickness i guess but Mm. yeah you have a diameter it's i downloaded it once upon a time but no not legal as a mini i do have a mini that has a bottle opener built into the bottom of it it's actually it also has a magnet on it so you can stick it on your fridge which is actually where mine is right yeah who is opening glass bottles on the course like that's just that's just bad (laughs) karma Mm. i don't know guess nobody (laughs) i hope not (laughs) So you shot the same in both rounds, and the second round was 24 points lower rated? Yeah, that, that's it. We'll see how that turns out once, like, I would kind of expect that those kind of come closer together once the... Because it's still pending. It's not official. Yeah. Kevin, that's pending. That means it, things can yeah, change, know, know. like orders and such. The fact that you have to look up at me for a year is pending. <laughs> I was really hoping to try to get to 960 this year, which there's still time. And I'm at 959. So I thought if I just had like a, you know, a slightly above average tournament that that would be all I needed. But I don't believe that's going to be the case once the next update happens. So that means I'll be looking for more tournaments to play this year, particularly the Wilcox December tournament and or the Two Town Turkey Trot and Wedge. Wilcox December tournament. Yeah. You ain't heard about it? Clearly not. Why is it clear? Because I just said Wilcox <laughs> December tournament. <laughs> yes, no, the Wilcox Wonderland on the 8th, which nice. is the first Saturday in December. Wait, is that even possible? It's a Sunday. Yes. Oh, it's a Sunday. Okay, even better. Sunday. Nice. So we know you played this course at least once before. What did you like, not like? What did I like? I like the location. It's literally 45 second drive to a Stewart's. Or Cumberland Farms. Yep. If you want good coffee, Jamin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's also a tops and a track supply company so you, you kind of have literally every base covered i'm a big fan of stone walls and piles of wood or logs which i didn't see much of but maybe jason could work on that as he's <laughs> setting up the fairways you can like stack some logs in between trees that's always cool i guess i'd just say the property in general like there's a babbling brook going through some of the holes and good elevation changes i didn't really mind the walks per se obviously the, the walk from 17 is boring you're just kind of walking through a field but i know that's just temporary but the walks through the actual woods are really nice what didn't you like i didn't like how wet my feet got walking <laughs> through some of the open holes <laughs> I got what about warming up in the field before hole one? Oh, i didn't mean yeah i didn't talk about that so after round one after i was kicking randy's ass uh, <laughs> I mean, we had the same score <laughs> um we were walking out the hole one to start round two and i i tell randy like oh hey you want to throw a couple of shots in the long tee of hole one that basically throws towards the short tee which we both thought was a fine idea so i take literally every one of my drivers everything that was like 10 speed or higher on forehand and backhand i chuck them all into the field randy and i walk about 100 feet down that field and instantly regret what the hell we just did because the <laughs> grass and stuff and what is it clover out there yeah, was clover. so mm-hmm. tall and thick that my waterproof shoes couldn't stand a chance. They were soaked, absolutely soaked. Like there was puddles in the inside of my shoes, and we could not find all of those discs. Randy found like all of mine except for one, and I did not have enough time to to find it. I thought we were starting at twelve forty five for some reason, and it was twelve thirty, but we were starting at twelve thirty five, so I had to just like give up on it, which was fine. I really only used it for like one or two holes, maybe. But um, once we finished, I knew we were going to have a lot of time before like the tournament kind of wrapped up. So I grabbed my post round beer. I told Randy, uh, well, actually, I told Hafner, asked if he wanted to come mm-hmm. help me find it which he said no 
So I'm not even I'm not even sure why he's here right now. Yeah, he told me you're not getting on if you say no. But uh, here we are. So I grab my destroyer and I'm like, I'm just gonna stand where I stood before. I'm just gonna chuck this thing, and I'm guessing it's gonna land near wherever my wraith was, to where Randy's like, Oh, so you're gonna lose two discs today? <laughs> <laughs> I walk out there, I chuck my destroyer on a forehand, and I watch where this one landed. I walk in a straight line for it, and wouldn't you know, I find my wraith and then a one step further than that was my destroyer so it landed within four feet of where my wraith landed so i came out with losing no discs what was your favorite hole damn what is my favorite hole i really like eight which i think is the downhill hole yeah the one everyone mm-hmm. forehands just because like you have especially now with the leaves on the ground like you have this nice rock wall on the left you're throwing a downhill shot the way that the lasassos have kind of like oriented these logs that are on the ground kind of makes it look like it might be like an island green but there's like an entrance to the green like it's a mm. physical like visual entrance to the green and then there's like a you know a slight drop off behind the basket so it adds a little bit of more risk to the shot it's like you can get close enough on your drive for a birdie putt but if you're that far away it makes you think twice now if you're randy he didn't think twice no, at all he, he laid didn't up. think twice at all yep <laughs> he laid it right up. <laughs> just absolute 20 foot death putt laid that up so easy <laughs> <laughs> i mean 18 although i didn't play that well like you really can't go wrong with a whole 18 on a course if you're throwing something downhill you know 500 plus feet for the record that's the one you got a six on and i got a five on I got a four on at the second round, though. Ah, uh, well, I, I aver- we both averaged the same. So. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Randy, what about your round? And well, before you get to your round, have you played this course before? Yeah, so I've played the Woods Loop at least three times. I think every time with Jamin. Oh, uh, geez, with Jason, they're not the same person. <laughs> same person. <laughs> and then I did a practice round with Corey, which was the first time I played the open holes, I think Wednesday before the tournament. I, I mean, I thought it was a bad thing at the time, but I just crushed that practice round. I shot like eight down. I didn't make any long putts. It was like all basically tap in birdies for those birdies and kind of walked away from that with like, shoot, I should not have done that right before the tournament because mm. now my expectations are going to be like crazy high. But I think luckily, I think the the slightly bad weather kind of reset me because I didn't have those same expectations knowing like footing was going to be different and and grip was going to be different so definitely approached it not thinking oh i'm just gonna go shoot eight down like twice in a row but that would have been sick if i did (laughs) but yeah first round i definitely played it a little safe definitely needed to warm up a little bit i think one of the problems with like a rainy morning didn't do any like full power throws i just like made some putts before the round started Uh, i think my my first tee shot i had my raincoat on still and just terrible form like didn't throw it the right way and took it off and pretty much after that i was okay but yeah round, round one went smooth i only had one double bogey from just just hacking my way through one of the wooded holes you know i I think i only missed one putt inside the circle it was just one of those days where i was just feeling good didn't shoot crazy hot i think the only reason Corey didn't you know cruise ahead of me was that that double bogey he took really (laughs) so i kind of just finished that round feeling good put it on me randy (laughs) i mean you you made me play better because you know jp didn't wow yeah no uh the first round though it, it was just one of those smooth rounds hitting my putts just it just felt good and and i thought yeah four down the first round felt really good like i didn't even think about the whole eight down practice round thing was was happy with my rating didn't really have much higher expectations and then going into second round playing with jason that like pushed me even more which was awesome i don't really feel like i've had that competitive feeling all year just something about being on the lead card having a chance to win just gave me that extra push to really focus I'll just skip ahead to uh, to hole 18 where basically Jamin. No, oh, geez, I keep. <laughs> that was so the anyways, just this you're one. giving away our secret. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So I was feeling really confident on 18. The first round, I had a pretty short putt for birdie on it. JP gave me the read on the the upshot on 18. It, with the rain and like the worst footing, it's basically just two full destroyer shots. That second shot, I was basically throwing standstill, so had to use like a high speed driver to get all the way to the pin. So I was able to birdie at first round, and then going into the final hole, I was back three strokes, and I threw pretty much the perfect tee shot. And then Jason turned his over, and if that had gone OB, I was pretty much green light to try and like win the tournament. And we get down there, and Jason is like ten feet safe, and just throws the perfectly safe shot over the top. 
So now I basically have to pin it and then he has to mess up an upshot and a putt. And, you know, I throw the upshot. I go high speed driver. My back foot slips a tiny bit, but the throw looks OK. I'm feeling good. We walk up there. It's, you know, 22 feet elevated pin. The rain has just started coming down since we threw the tee shot. And Jason has a 10 footer. And I realized like the odds of me making this putt, the odds of him. Would you have to double putt that? Either way, it was very unlikely. And I just checked the scores real quick, you know, to tied for second. If I just lay up and tap it in, my body just went to like jello, just like you're never going to make this putt kind of feeling. And I was like, fine, laid it up, took my tap in, like walked away happy. So I think that solidifies my decision last week on the laying up in that scenario. <laughs> so Randy, I was wondering when you check the scores before laying up, because mm-hmm. I noticed JP birdied the last hole for them, which was hole one. Was he a, do you remember? Like, he was he, finished. Okay. His score was finished. So I was basically locked for second place if I just put that against the uh, the pedestal and, and tapped in. So it was unfortunate because the rain really wasn't coming down when we teed off. And then Troy had that shot in the OB that we looked for for much longer than three minutes. And it went from like casual rain to like kind of pouring. And that just added on to that decision of like, if I airball this putt, I have to make another comeback putt in the pouring rain. And like, it was just an easy decision at that point to take the gas pedal off and, and just finish the tournament. And you don't give Corey a chance to, to tie you. I don't think Corey ever had a chance to tie me. I mean, there was definitely chances there. I oh, if, if I triple putted the hole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Oh, in the end, maybe not, but there was definitely <laughs> chances throughout the day. Yeah. I get, I'll dial back a little just to brag, but I started the second round two birdies in a row and was like tied for the lead just pretty much immediately. So immediately had that feeling of like, oh, geez, I now have to just like battle with Jason for the next like 16 holes. And I don't know, I think I lost that pretty quick. Like you just gained those strokes back and I was chasing you the whole time. But um, it was still cool to, to be chasing you. Jason, that hole 18, it's a raised basket. So it's a 700 plus foot hole with a raised basket there's a basket over to the right by the bush is that like the actual spot or is the raised basket in the location that the actual hole will be so we can only keep it in the fields in the winter time so in uh the summertime it'll be moved over okay you got to get like a wrap or something that's got some kind of stone wall on it. That's so why I'm just throwing it out there. Or like a stone wall riser or something. Ooh, oh man, you're see. I, I have like ideas for like a cool legacy trophy too. That it's probably gonna take me a couple of years to build it, but it's gonna be cool. We didn't talk about the trophy. I guess we'll we'll talk about those near the end. But at what point are the monorails gonna be installed on the pathways so we can get to our holes quicker? <laughs> Thank you, golf carts, please. <laughs> Yeah, that's how we're uh, we're gonna fundraise for the tour. You're gonna have to pay for that, so it's an mm. added feature. Great, that's another course right. where I have to avoid hitting the goddamn chairlift on hole 18 again. <laughs> Mini mighty gaw. So we didn't mention it, but Corey tied for fourth at minus eight. So I'm assuming Corey, that was a minus four, minus four. It was a 55 and a 55. Yep. Mm-hmm. First round was a minus five. <laughs> First round was a minus five. Well, before Jason fixed it. Before oh, <laughs> fixed that hole that I eagled. All right, that's fair. What did you like about the course? Kind of selfishly, what I like about the course is the distances are really good for like our kind of local pro scene. There's big scoring separation if you can throw about 400 feet so i got to like play my own game which was nice like pretty much the whole day i was relaxed and like knew what discs to throw i think i don't know if it was on purpose but almost every wooded hole is like a single angle shot and kind of the same for the wide open with the exception of like a max distance kind of flip up shot you can throw one angle shots the whole day and and score well so it was really easy to decide what to do you can really simplify that course so it was just comfortable i think that's what i liked the most at least about playing what did you not like about the course i feel like i would normally complain about the t pads not being finished but they didn't really affect me after like my very first throw i pretty much figured out like just got to plant a little harder and like just dig in and commit to your to your t shots and and i really didn't have any total goofs after that one so i don't know i really can't complain too much i, I had a good day and with the with the rain like the pavilion kind of created a nice vibe like everyone was hanging out because we all had to hang out in the same place <laughs> i kind of hope that continues even if the weather good in the future but yeah that was that was nice and your favorite hole 
I think my favorite hole is 18. It's just, it's a, it's a good view. You get to see your disc fly. It brings in a lot of chaos, honestly. Like it's, it's nice to have a hole 18 where things can happen and, and, you know, can change the result. So yeah, I like 18. All right. So John, how about your round? You had, you played there before? No, I had not played before. What did you think? I enjoyed it. It was um, a little weird to me, just, uh, you know, the difference between the temp holes and all the wooded holes. But um, overall, it was fine. I I still enjoyed everything. It was just, uh, you know, you had to get yourself in a certain mindset for each nine, I guess. You had your nine wooded holes, which I guess is the original, and then the temp holes, and just huge difference between both of them. It was definitely nice having Randy and Corey on the card with me, showing me where things were. We started on hole two, and I had not taken any throws. So didn't throw at all, didn't touch a disc, didn't putt at all. I guess I took two throws right before the round. And, uh, you know, it was kind of cold out, wasn't feeling great. Corey was generous enough to give me a hand warmer, but it didn't work. So uh, my hand <laughs> stayed cold the entire round. And, um, you know, we started, get a couple pars, get a birdie on the second hole. And um, my putting just wasn't doing it. So I think, you know, the third through eighth hole, I probably had about four missed putts mid circle one to edge of circle two where i was just hitting metal from all over it wasn't like good metal i was hitting cage i was hitting band which some of these baskets don't have a band so i don't know (laughs) how i was doing that but i was just parring a couple bogeys in there and it was pretty lackluster to be honest i was mentioning to randy that i think it was the temperature that kind of got to me i have a pretty spinny putt i popped my fingers pretty fast and they just kind of weren't popping so yeah i think it was three bogeys five birdies on that round i finished two under we got to hole 18 and i was debating trying to go over or not randy gave me the push to do so and i cleared it by i think 30 feet i felt pretty good about the throw and it was only 30 feet past I threw my upshot, which was a destroyer, and I was about, I don't know, 60 feet short. So I brought all the danger into play for nothing. I parred the hole, gave Randy that nice little read, told him to disc up, mm-hmm. and uh, he did birdie it. And then I, I think I birdied one, got a pretty fortunate kick, actually, to be parked under that basket. It was like a weird bounce, went straight up in the air and kind of just nestled right underneath to finish at minus two, adjusted. I did also eagle that hole with Corey, I guess. We're the only one that got a two on on that round one, at least. Going into round two, I played with Danny Parton, who I played with for both rounds. Got to play with Mooch and also Nick Cardone, who I'd never played with before. So it was a good card. We started off and once again, part hole two, part hole three, part hole four. And then once we got into the woods, I went on a little turkey run at three in a row, the putting had fixed itself. It, it didn't feel good, but I learned how to adjust for it. It was really weird trying to almost force my hand open. Danny did give me a hand warmer that round, and this one did work, so it was a little better. In Corey's defense, that hand warmer worked the three previous tournaments he used it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he opened it himself. If, if, uh, if there was, it was old, know. though. It had a bunch of dust on it. I don't know where that <laughs> thing was sitting. Yeah, listen, they don't just go bad. Mine was warm. Thanks, Corey. Randy seemed to know a thing or two about hand warmers. Do those go bad, Randy? Uh, they do go bad. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, well, they wasn't that old. <laughs> Thank you. Like I they said, my mommy old. gets me a big bag of them every year for Christmas because she knows I like them. And she even gives me the super hand one, too, the big one. That was one of the big ones. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it didn't work. So <laughs> next time, bring your own, goddammit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I will. Hope I <laughs> Usually I just wear these big gloves when it gets cold, like my skiing gloves. Keeps my hands nice and warm. So a couple pars after that birdie stretch, and then I think I got another four in a row, all in mm-hmm. the woods, except for uh, that first temporary hole. So the 325 wide open in the field. The devil, as I call yeah. it. <laughs> and then uh, the hole I eagled the first round, I did not. I took a nice par on that, adjusted, so it was a three. Birdied the next hole. And then going into 17, I was thinking if I go par, par, birdie, I think I'll finish in a good spot. So I parred 17. I had a long look at it, which I ran, but, you know, nice little par. And then 18, I was debating on the tee pad with Muccelli going back and forth. Do I try to clear it? Do I not try to clear it? I think I was 
eight down for the round at that time. I was one stroke ahead of Troy Whitten, sitting in third place, and one stroke behind Randy. So I made the decision not to go for it. Being that first round, I, I went for it, felt good, and I was only 30 feet past. So what happened if I didn't feel good about it? I felt like it was going to go right OB. So I laid it up, went big on my second shot, and it gave myself about a 100-foot look, which I, I ran. And uh, it was a good run. I missed it, though. And then hole one, I threw my standstill forehand, just like the first round. And I actually ended up about 30 feet short. So I had to make a nice little 30-foot straddle to get to nine down for that round, which ended up tying me with Randy. Yeah, it was a pretty good round. Putting was working. That was the biggest difference between round one and two. And you had the hot round on the day, is that correct? I believe so. Course record. Course record, yeah. Cool. And then after the rounds, shout out to Justin Muccelli here. I forgot my bag. So I left the course. I was hanging out at the raffle, you know, enjoying myself. And I just kind of got in my car and left. <laughs> I was about 15 minutes away and I have four calls from Muccelli. I finally answered him. And yeah, I left my bag at the course. So I had to turn around and grab that. So thank you, <laughs> Justin, for getting that for me. Yeah, he talked to everybody else. We wanted to just like all individually send you individual photos of your discs. So, like they were all found <laughs> out on the course somewhere. And he's like, no, he's probably only 15 minutes away. We should call him. Like, all right, well, that's how he started the conversation. He said, what did you throw on hole two? And uh, he's like, name in my discs to me. And by the second one, I was like, oh, my bag's there, isn't it? So a little U-turn and, uh, you know, added 30 minutes to the drive. But I I think my wallet was in there. So it's pretty good that he did call. Is that where you normally keep it? Yeah. Yeah. Go go feel free next time. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So these ratings are still pending, Jason. Is that correct? They'll be official when they do the update. What is it, next month? Probably. Yeah. I mean, because that's 996. That's pretty close. I was kind of sad about that because the uh, 20-point differential between the – first and second round i've hit a thousand before but only once so it would have been nice to get that jason did make a good point a lot of people were playing blind or it might have been jason so everyone knew the course the second round so naturally Mm. you know the scores are going to go down a little bit ratings are going to seemingly get a little worse but yeah 996 is what it came out at if I were to guess, I would think that when they do the official, they'll kind of average them, which would push yours up, so possibly over 1,000. But this event had a pretty small sample size, so it's only 26 players. And there was also, like, the FA1 rating was a 198 round two. So, like, I don't know how they're going to factor that in when they do the official updates. But I think Muccelli's kind of banking on that right now. So his first round, he was saying if it drops 10 points, it'll definitely drop from his rating. And if his second round goes up, then it just benefits him to uh, have that happen. It would pretty much mean he didn't have a bad day. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I could see round one going down and round two going up. John, what did you like about the course? I liked all the holes. I was mentioning, I I guess I'll be a little pessimistic first, but I was mentioning before how it just felt like, like I had to switch my thinking on them. All the open holes are so drastically different than the wooded holes. It was almost like playing two rounds, but everything was super fair, especially the wooded holes, which I really enjoyed. There didn't seem to be anything fluky. It was a hit your line, shoot well type of course, maybe hole 15. But even that, uh, uh, when I first stepped on the tee pad, it was like, what the heck is this? But even when you step up to that, it's uh, and actually look at the fairway, there, there's an intended line there. And if you hit it, you're going to do well on the hole. It was really nice in the woods. Randy and I were talking about this, that you could see everything. You can see about, I don't know how many it is exactly, but maybe six holes all around you. It was really cool to see that. And some of the walks got to me. Uh, I wear these barefoot shoes. They're zeros. So I have absolutely no padding on the bottom of my feet. Some of the hard pan got to me a little in that round. My feet were absolutely aching. But once it got out into the fields and it was, you know, a little softer, it was fine. But all the holes were great. I like the lines. I'm a very one angle type of player. A lot of these guys on here know. I throw hyzers. I'll throw them forehand, backhand, you know. So it kind of suited my game there. Would you say that those shoes also gave you trouble when it came time to crush a 12 ounce can with your foot? <laughs> so I'm, I'm just terrible at that in general. But I was also, I think, partially sitting down at the time. So <laughs> I wouldn't attribute it to the shoes. No. That's fair. And your favorite hole? I know it's been said twice, but I think it's got to be 18. 
that's kind of right in my range where my distance starts petering out. I, I did clear it the first round, but it definitely makes me think. And I enjoy holes that challenge me a little bit mentally. And going down the stretch, it did just that. So, All right. So you and Randy tied for second place at minus 11. Jason, how was your round? Uh, it was a fun time. So it was a Sunday tournament. So I had team challenge the day before. Played two rounds at Minekill, which is very, you know, physically demanding course. You're going up and down a lot. And then uh, being concerned about running a C tier the next day, right after our second round at Minekill, I went to Greenville and walked the entire course to make sure the kids didn't knock over the baskets. I'm guessing it's probably some like nine or 10 year olds doing it. But so I got home, you know, after dark and then realized I had to finish making some of those trophies. I had to like print out everything. I had to do a lot of work for this event. I wasn't as prepared as I would be for other events that we run, like Mind Kill or the League. I've done a lot of events, so it's kind of like muscle memory. But honestly, when I showed up Sunday morning and the first guy came in to check in, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, I was just like exhausted. I'm like, oh yeah, I got to get a tag thing. I got to, you know, tell you there's players packs. But I figured it out. Coffee kind of kicked in. And by the time we actually went out to go play, realized I didn't even have my putters. They were at my house because they were in Jess's car, which wasn't starting. So she took a different one. So I went into my trailer. I found a, like a backup putter and up using that. Worked out fantastic. It's actually probably just going to be the one I putt with now. Is it a wizard? No. In July, I switched to MVP ions. Mm. Really like those. They've been working out well for me. But yeah. So I played the first round. With Muccelli, Troy Whitten, and uh, the MA1 player, Nick Cardone. Yeah, it felt pretty good about the round the whole time. I didn't make any mistakes. It was bogey free, shot a personal best, despite, you know, some wet feet. Really, kind of like the last few weeks, been figuring out the best way to score on some of the holes was. And then going into round two, had a little bit of a lead, but being on a card with Troy, I mean, he's like an OG, you know, top player. He's um, qualified for USCGC, the Monday qualifier, way back when. He's played on like tour events. I know he's got like a lot of skill. And then Randy, you know, shooting that eight down earlier and, and basically having the highest score on the leaderboard on UDISC, you know, that was in the back of my head. And then Corey, I know like he could definitely climb and, and take the win too. So, you know, I wanted to win, but it was kind of like, all right, I'll just try to do my best. And and we got started and like Randy came out really hot and I'm like, okay, this is probably done for me. I think he figured out the course and he's just going to birdie out now. And fortunately, like I kind of found my rhythm in the middle and started getting a lot more birdies. And then about like two thirds of the way through, I was like doing pretty good. I think I've got a shot at just taking us down if I don't screw up. Yeah, I got down to hole 18 and I was a little hesitant about trying to clear the wall. Figured I'd go for it. So I sent my medium destroyer as hard as I could and the thing just flipped over and it just kept going and going, going right. Almost to the point where it was almost the whole twos tee pad. Which we joked about before we made the <laughs> hole. Like, oh, I wonder if, is that OB if you land on the T-pad yeah. over there? It, it was. And but so like if you haven't played Holy Teen, when you throw your drive, there's a stone wall in the middle that's OB. And part of it is like eclipsed by the hill. So when you're dis lands, you really don't know if you're in or out until you walk down there. And so I had a pretty good feeling like, oh, I might be OB. And then, you know, this this could be a game changer at the end. Fortunately, I was barely in by uh, not too much and just kind of had to like scramble from there to get par, which wasn't too hard. But yeah, it was a good tournament. I shot over my rating, which is also great. So uh, if that sticks, then yeah, it's a good tournament for me. John shot the hot round, but you had actually the highest rating with your first round, uh, 997. 52 yes yeah, i'm expecting that to change but still salty about it yeah it'll change it'll <laughs> hold in there jp it'll be fine yeah i mean honestly the conditions were definitely in my opinion worse the second round first round was pretty comfortable randy was complaining the whole time that you stole his idea for the trophies how did the trophies work i totally stole his idea yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it worked out i mean like i had a few different ideas my main idea was to uh, wood burn those wooden circles. And uh, I ended up using my laser engraver and my 3D printer. But then I got the idea like, oh, like this is Stonewall Classic. And I'm sure Randy's trophies, you know, had a part in the back of my mind. And I'm like, oh, I could just like mount these on a rock and it would be cool. So I went through the course finding suitable rocks. And I definitely know what Randy means about finding like rocks that will sit without rocking and present themselves well and i found enough of them to make trophies out of the actual stones from the stone walls 
Well, that was the question I had. Were they actually from the stone walls? Because Mark Bryan, I told him, I said, you know, Jason went out and actually found those. And he said, well, were, were they from actual stone walls? Because this is the stone wall class. And I'm like, I can't, I can't answer that. So, but they were actually from stone walls. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm hoping I'm not incriminating myself, but yeah, they're from. Uh, that was what I was worried about. Like, I know you're not allowed to take rocks from the Grand Canyon. So I didn't know if, if that was the same here. Yeah. There's only a billion other stones left on the course now. <laughs> All so. Right, so there's plenty of room left for more years trophies then, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We run out of uh, trophies. We got problems. <laughs> <laughs> But no, they're from the course. I don't know if they were all from like the stone walls per se, but we'll say they all are, except for the one Mark Bryan got. His was just found on the on the ground randomly. <laughs> His isn't actually a rock. It's actually just petrified dog shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that one. <laughs> Those two kept talking about rollers. And I was like, I'm always worried about like holes or poop. They just took off from there. And I must have heard 58 poop jokes. So <laughs> there was a lot of random poop out there. Mm. I mean, it's in nature. I'm not saying that people are just out there pooping, but every time they saw any, they pointed it out like, oh, don't throw a roller here. I was like, okay, thanks, guys. There was all different kinds of animal poop out there. <laughs> There's a lot of wildlife in Greenville, especially at that park. Mm. When I was leaving the other night, like you hear coyotes. There's tons of deer. There's uh, bears. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't quite know if a bear shits in a wood, but it definitely shits <laughs> in the middle of a field where there's a disc golf <laughs> basket. <laughs> All right. Well, Jason, I know you played the course before. We know what you like, what you don't like. What is your favorite hole at that course? There's a few that I really like, but if I had to pick one, I think hole nine is my favorite. It's the one where there's like a slight turnover shot to the basket that's near the stream. I think that that hole, it has like the stone wall that's kind of guarding the green, which I like. It has the stream behind it, which is very like peaceful and just it creates this interesting space around the green and the shot i don't know it's a fun shot i think that you can throw forehand and kind of like guarantee yourself a par if you hit the line but if you want to go like really aggressive you have to kind of like flip something up that's gonna fight back a little bit yeah i was surprised to hear that was not randy's favorite hole either i was gonna say i think you won the tournament because you designed that hole because <laughs> instead of the, the rock wall wasn't guarding anything it was the first tree on the right that was guarding everything because yeah i managed to to just hit i think five different trees when i played that hole uh, you also missed a 20 footer uh, yeah let's say it was 20 feet <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably my favorite hole personally. I do like finishing on 17 and 18. I think 17, it wasn't as fun for the event because it was just a little bit more boring without the landscape behind it. But I like that hole. It uh, requires a good nose angle if you want to like reach it, at least with my power, my distance. I have to throw like the nose angle perfect to get that far. So it's a good challenge for me. And then hole 18, I think, just racks up some mental stuff. So you got to make a decision if you're going to try to clear it, clear it or not. And honorable mention, I like hole four. I don't know if I'm alone in that, but I like the fact that like you have to have like an okay drive, but there's a pretty big bandwidth where it can land. But then that like changes your upshot through that gap trees. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all the feedback. It's one of the great things about doing an event is you kind of test stuff out and we're pretty early. I mean, we're really, we just started installing the course this year pretty much. So it's nice to hear a lot of that feedback and then we can kind of, you know, develop and progress the course in the way that makes the most sense. Absolutely. Who provided lunch? That's the tasting lab. They're uh, right in the heart of Greenville. So like the heart of Greenville is the traffic light we have, which is at the intersection of Route 32 and 81. And if you just bear a little east on 81, tasting lab is right there between the light and Stewart's. And uh, it's a small place. They have really good food, probably a little bit more pricier than the other places in Greenville, but they have great beer on tap. They have good atmosphere and a good variety of different types of burgers from beef burger, elk burger, venison, all sorts of stuff like that. So good place. Oh, that hipster shit too, that Wagyu stuff or whatever they call it. Oh yeah, the, the Wagyu. <laughs> yeah. I saw that on the menu. I don't know if they still do it. I haven't been in there because we usually just order from them. But like the tasting lab, it's a theme on like dogs, like Labrador. Oh, Labrador. Oh, okay. As long as it's not a shepherd because Randy would never understand. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so their like logo is like a lab with like glasses and they used to have like dog bowls that like some of the food would go in and stuff. It's just like a weird theme they have. I don't know if they still do that or not, but uh, it's a cool place. Awesome. Good job. I thought I thought it was great. Anybody have any other comments on it? I enjoyed myself out despite everything else. <laughs> Did you get your umbrella? I did, and I just realized that's what I was yelling about, Randy. He was oh. yelling about that. I passed him when he was yelling about that. Hmm. We saw an umbrella just sitting up against one of the rock walls by the basket. Yeah, I left it on the wall on nine. Nick Silvano found it. 
somebody else had seen it first, said that they would leave it there. Then Nick Silvano saw it, texted me a, a picture, told me where it was. I said, all right, he's, I'm leaving it there. And then I'm, we're walking, and I guess you guys had just finished. Mark yelled, hey, to the cart ahead of us, did you guys leave an umbrella? And they said no, or they didn't answer, whatever. So we finished the hole, and we were like, what do we do with the umbrella? And Tim, who already was hitting trees with his umbrella because he's Alex height. <laughs> so then he had two of them walk into the next hole or the, the hole after. They yelled something to Cronky and, and they were, yeah, they went back and forth with the umbrella. So we just left it there. I'm like, even in the middle of a trail, I'll trip over it. I won't be able to, I won't yeah. be able to miss it. Well, my thinking was, I hope a card or two behind us doesn't grab it. That would have been the running gag for the hole. Yeah. Let's talk about New York Team Challenge. We had CPS at Mindkill, uh, Randy, Jamin, and Jason, just because I don't think we've heard from them tonight. Jamin, <laughs> how, did you, how did it go? Everything went super well for me. Had a fun card both rounds. Can't really remember the last time I had quite that much fun, just like with the cards. So that was super nice. I played with Justin Hickok for the first time. And then second round, I played with Bohansky and Tim Giardini and one other person. Pete Hodge. Thank you. Peter Hodge, my partner. Mm-hmm. Let's see the tricky thing with when you're riding on somebody's back the entire time, you don't get to look at their face. <laughs> so, <you know? laughs> yeah, no, he, he like he held it together the entire time while I just like messed up. But no, it was super fun. Very disappointed in the outcome. But it's one of those things that, you know, CPS is a hard fighting team. And, you know, they always seem to win in a little bit of a playoff. So they're scrappy. I don't know how to get better at being scrappy as a team, but we'll figure it out. Maybe it's losing close matches like that. That kind of over time gets you where you need to go. When's the last time you played Minekill? Actually, I played it a few weeks ago. I was down in the area. I just played the front nine. It was probably about a month ago now. So it's always nice to get back out there. The course is playing really, really well. Dan Eigner apparently did a whole bunch of work that looked like there was a lot of like weed whacking on 12 and 13 and you know just a lot of a lot of work for a course that hasn't seen a an event in you know four months so how was your singles round uh, my singles round was good i played mike g i believe that's mike guido super nice guy first time i've ever played against him he just wasn't connecting on birdies when he needed to and i having played green to green so many times it, i'm just getting the birdies that i know i can and was able to kind of kind of cruise a little bit i didn't have to do anything too flashy make any big putts or anything so i was able to kind of keep that locked down for the majority of the match he did ace on hole two which was pretty awesome but it was after our match so it didn't matter (laughs) randy as a captain Mm. is this board the order in which the matchups were made yes so that is something i I guess I thought about it, but that was one of the few things I didn't realize going into it because I've always wondered like how we decide who plays with each other in the first round and just like card wise, not against each other. And I didn't realize, yeah, it's just the straight up the order that you pick things. And because I got to play with Dave Hudson during the first round, we were actually just talking like general decision making as a captain and stuff. And like he's thinking about that during the matchups. So there's like good chemistry and like that never crossed my mind until after it was all done. That was one of the few things I learned. I think putting Justin with Jamin kind of accidentally was really beneficial for Justin. This was his first time playing match play, I think, and first time doing team challenge. So he was able to like pick up on a lot from Jamin, I think. The reason I asked initially was because he's the next to last person. Mm -hmm. Was there any kind of strategy at that point? Yeah. So Justin is our lowest rated guy and Jamin was our highest. So I was kind of holding on to them for when the opportunity arose to throw them out. And it ended up just kind of working out at the end to be, you know, that kind of calculated win loss. And uh, Justin almost won his match. So that would have been sick. Mm, Because he he got Ethan Hatters. Yeah. I mean, that was a basically a hundred point rating difference. And it Mm. came down to, I think, two holes. He almost took it to the end. I don't know how you get three and one. I'm going to be honest. They were dormy with two to go. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they play that hole. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. But yeah, so he basically took it to the end, which is phenomenal. Jamin, this is the beginning of the team challenge year. I would, I would ask you to explain the definition of dormy. (laughs) So uh, dormy means that the amount of holes you have left is the same amount of points that your opponent has on you. So if you win the hole, you keep going. You can't win the entire match, but you can push it because in match play, if it's, you know, 0-0 after 18 holes, it's a push and each person gets half a point or each team gets half a point. If I'm dormy, I'm running everything for putt. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Was that everything on round one? 
Uh, for me, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll go to the other guys. Uh, Jason, what about your round one? Uh, my round one was great. I played against Danny White, and I was on a card with Tim J and Peter Hodge. I don't think I've ever played with Pete before, but like he's got a really upbeat personality, and he was just like playing really well. Tim J and Danny are both, you know, old school guys that can shoot really well, and us both beating them on the card felt great. So yeah, great round one. How old's Peter Hodge? Would you say? I have no idea. Younger than you? Yeah. Okay, so it was the young guys versus the old guys, you could argue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, Tim J and Danny White are, you know, they're veteran disc golf for sure. But we were playing green to green, so I probably had, like, the farthest distance by quite a bit on that card, and it didn't really give me much of an advantage on a lot of the holes. But, yeah, Danny, I think his putting was a little off, which helped me. I came out really hot. Like, I buried a bunch of holes at the beginning. I think I was, like, up, like, after the first five or six holes, maybe I was up, like, four or five, I don't remember. And then, you know, he kept joking, oh, you know, we're not going to be able to play as long. You're going to be waiting in the pavilion if you beat me this early. <laughs> and in the back of my head, I'm thinking, like, no, I know how this goes. Like, you're going to find your, like, rhythm, and then all of a sudden I'm going to lose this match somehow. <laughs> So I kept playing as, as you know as good as I could, and I'm glad I did because he did find his rhythm in the middle and and um, started to climb back at it. But yeah, it was fun. When's the last time you played Mindkill? I think June. Yeah, it's been a while. I can't think of a time I've played it since then. Oh, you know what? I did play a few holes. We did a um, presentation for the Gaboa Historical Society. And- mm played a few holes there okay but not a full round no randy before you get into your round this is your first time captaining any kind of team challenge yeah yep how was that it was new we did a mock draft like two nights before just so i like understood how it went down because like i've always had a general idea but didn't really have real strategies so it was nice to kind of do that the night before and have a little smoother of a time in the morning this is also i'm sure jess has sat in on many matchups and like doing the whiteboard and stuff but it was pretty much her first time also calling the shots so we had a plan going into it and we pretty much stuck to that plan in both rounds we stuck to our plan it almost worked out i think first round it it did work out you know cps is a good team we're, we're not gonna have like a landslide win in either round and you know being up in the first round was good it, it, our matchmaking pretty much went the way it was supposed to when you say you did a mock you did it with jess me and jess versus jason jason pretend oh. dave hudson which i'm sure was difficult for him but well he's he an actor best. you know i get it <laughs> And then the only other curveball was I bought the keg for the day and the tap handle they gave me was busted off. Uh. You know, they give it to you in like a bag that I'm assuming they like, I'm hoping they clean it and they put it in a bag so it stays clean. I take it out of the bag and yeah, the the lever on the handle is snapped off and I'm supposed to go do matchups in like two seconds. So I'm just like, Jason, please. And uh, and Jason had a pair of pliers, of course, and like (laughs) disassembled the top of it. The ones from his cart that he couldn't use on his cart. He just, you know, oh, <laughs> is that where they came from? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he took the mechanism apart and had a pair of pliers like permanently holding it open. So the only way to dispense beer was with like the pump, like regulating the internal pressure. So we probably lost at least eight beers worth of like trickling throughout the day because we just had to put it down in a cup and it would just like drip. But it got drank. I think I tried to have my neighbors drink it with me when I got home and there was actually (laughs) only like three beers left in it. So we did a good job. I got switched back. So it was it was a nice drinkable beer. Unfiltered. Too high ABV. Yeah. It's the beer. Yeah. Unfiltered. I was going to say you lost eight beers. That's Corey's pregame ritual right there. (laughs) (laughs) So pouring out for all my homies. All eight of them. So well, what about your round? Round one. So Dave Hudson called me out the night before. Of course, we played each other last year. So I knew like partway through matchups, it was time for us to throw somebody out and it was kind of time to mix it up a little bit. So I threw myself out knowing he would answer that call. So we played each other and the whole round we were joking about how we were going to push the round and we didn't play well at all. We scored points on each other by the other person messing up. I think the first hole we played was 14 down the hill and I threw my tee shot first directly into the left side of the big tree next to the pin, which is basically the worst thing you can do. And I took that hole. 
because <laughs> he triple putted it. So that pretty much wraps up like how that whole round went. It was just kind of a disaster of someone doing worse than the other guy. We definitely had some some good throws mixed in there, but it was kind of hilarious the way that we scored points on each other. Yeah, we got to the end and it was the uphill hole 13 and it's a really hard birdie hole. I managed to not outdrive him by like three feet. So then I have to go first and I know he's going to run it from 40 feet down the hill. And I just lay it up because I did not feel like missing another short putt that day. And he and he gave it a little run and he was parked and I had to make a little 12 footer and luckily did. And, and we pushed around, which I think was destiny the whole time. So we basically just hung out for an hour and a half. <laughs> Yeah. It, was, it didn't really feel like a battle at all. It was a really good time. Since we have a captain on, who was thrown out, Danny White or Jason? Danny White, I think, was thrown out, and we answered with Jason. And what about Mike G and Jamin? I think Mike G was thrown out, so it was basically a, a calculated scenario in that case. Okay. Um, yeah. After one round, the mind kill whips are up 10.5 to 7.5. What about the, the spread? We got three biased opinions, but anything notable? Justin Hickok made a ton of pulled pork, had a homemade slaw, brought like buns for sliders. I think that might have been our, our hit. I'm sure Jamin disagrees. No, that slaw was awesome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a deconstructed slider where I just put a big pile of meat on my plate and then like twice as much slaw and just like had it like that. It was great. He also mentioned I, I didn't get any because I showed up three minutes before we were supposed to play like usual. <laughs> He said he brought coffee, but I didn't. Was yeah, there, I didn't notice. All right. All right. So you're up three points going into the dubs round. Any thoughts, Randy, as far as matchups? Yeah. So we had partners predecided, kind of based on vibe, a lot based on like skill pairings. Like we wanted to have some strong combos. You're more middle and then maybe some wild cards at the bottom. And the only curveball we really had was that Koch was leaving after the first round. And we asked some people, we had already been playing reserves, I guess. So we didn't have any reserves to come play the second round. Instead of asking like someone random that might not be like dedicated to the team, we just asked Kat, my wife, to come for the second round. Does she not play on a team challenge team? This year, she's being a reserve for us just so we don't have to spend so much on a babysitter. And that has already backfired. We had her come for the second round. So we're using a ladies reserve spot to fill in for a men's spot to not kind of burn a reserve spot. So that at a lot of courses wouldn't be that big a deal. And now in hindsight, playing the mind kill orange tea layout, it was difficult. Like having someone who can throw far would have been a bigger advantage. I think that was maybe the only maybe mistake during matchups was I didn't think about it till it was kind of too late and there was nobody left to play against that we really had a chance beating. I think that for matchups is really the only kind of goof that I managed. And then the rest, it came down to some playoffs. It came down to single stroke differences. It was a very, very close matchup. Jason, you played doubles with Jess. How'd that go? Great. It was another fun card. Jess and I played Dave and Kate. Dave Hudson? Yeah, the Dave Hudson and Caitlin Rommel. But yeah, no, it was, it was fun. Mind Kill was absolutely beautiful this time of year. Good views of the Catskill Mountains. I love the tournament layout. So we get to play orange to the MKDGC layout. CPS, they've got some strong doubles teams. It's kind of like how we lost last year, too. I think them always having dubs leagues near their course, they know like pairings really well. They're a hard team to beat in doubles, but it came close, came down to the last card. So like literally Dan Eigner's card went into a playoff and that was deciding whether they won or not. I think they went to a three hole playoff. So we were all just like eagerly waiting at the pavilion, drinking beer, having a good time. With a fully open tap. Yeah. Yeah. It was open to them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I use the same vice grips that I used from my cart <laughs> i usually carry like certain things around that come in handy a lot vice grips is very handy to have same thing with like electrical tape and uh, i had a swiss army knife i was ready to fix stuff so it worked out Corey, how many sets of vice grips in your bag right now mm, none but I, 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 those are <laughs> those are your everyday carry vice grips jason <laughs> i don't know when they made it in my rotation of my disc golf bag but yeah somehow i've been carrying them around i usually always carry a swiss army knife because that's coming handy more times than normally i just bring a baseball in case anyone wants to get a quick inning in 
<laughs> so you don't have any uh, vice grips on your like car batteries or anything? <laughs> no, no, they're not that janked up yet. I'll, I mean, I'd usually drive around with like a mechanics tool set, like a 112 piece socket set. You know, all you no. need is a screwdriver and vice grips. I don't need any other tools. Come on. <laughs> yeah. like, you were three and one in your picks. What do you think of that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> didn't see that coming, but. That's pretty good. That's like a 970 rated pick. I don't want to listen to Corey talk about it, so I, I better get off now. <laughs> no, I ain't got a whole lot to say. I can tell you that, but you'll but. hear it. <laughs> okay, so Jason and Jess won their match by three. Jamin, you played with Pete Hodge? How'd that go? That went great. Pete is, he's just like a very level-headed, very fun person to play disc golf with. I knew he wasn't actually a lefty, but I didn't hear the whole story until this weekend he writes left-handed but does all sports with his right hand and then started playing disc golf with his right hand and this is a confusing story dislocated one of his fingers on his right hand and just switched over to lefty throwing and hasn't gone back so he it's pretty interesting he i think he putts with his right hand and just throws hyzers with his left hand and a little bit of turnovers. I don't think he has any forehand or anything like that, but he's just like really solid with the technical aspects of disc golf. He's a former ultimate player, so he's one of those jerks. <laughs> <laughs> I knew a guy who threw left-handed, kind of a similar situation, but he could not forehand left hand. It, it looks silly. So yeah. that might be part of it. I, I don't know how that works, but yeah, it's, it's crazy to think that he's not throwing with his comfortable hand because it, he's just so freaking good at it. Mm. But yeah, so we, it was uh, he and I playing Bohansky and Tim Giardini, which is always a scary doubles pairing to have to go against. Tim is just, you know, he's been lethal longer than I've even been playing the sport. And AB is just AB. Yeah, the first. Mm. So yeah, a lot of fun. They had us by, I think, one point going into the back nine. We started on one. So when we got to 10, they had us by a stroke. We almost eagled hole nine, which felt really nice. I would start to try to air out my drives on that hole a little bit more, and it's been working. Getting over that little hill in the landing zone is something that I didn't think I was capable of, but I've kind of started to figure it out. Jason mentioned in the first round it was green to green. Yeah, it's the mind kill layout. So it's it's like best basket orange tees. So like hole nine's orange to orange. Okay. That's a hole that I used to just throw like basically, I think three mid ranges on, maybe a putter in there somewhere and then take my birdie and kind of move on. But seeing some of the bigger arms at the mind kill disc golf championship play that hole kind of lit a fire. So I've been trying to throw a little bit farther and see what I can expand on. But so we started to kind of build a little bit of lead on the back nine, and they just weren't quite able to mount any sort of a comeback. Although on the last hole, Tim Giardini did solo eagle 18, which was very impressive. I thought that they were just taking a birdie, but it was Tim. Tim eagle being on Tim? Par five. Yeah, which is just the most Tim thing ever is to very sneakily do something really good. Tim's not a very flashy player, but he's also always right where he needs to be, and you kind of forget about it sometimes. Two strokes, and that I guess that eagle made it look closer than the actual scoring. Yeah, they had bogeyed hole 17 prior, trying to make it. Tim ran like a 70, 80 footer for birdie, and it rolled like 50 feet away. And then Bohansky did the same thing and almost made it, but it rolled like 50 feet away because 17 is kind of a sloped green. So they trying to mount and come back at that time, but it was just nothing was working for them. If that had sat down, then it might've been closer, but I still think we won by a couple. I should say Peter won by a couple. (laughs) My driving was there occasionally and I was able to definitely, you know, contribute here and there. But like when it came to the putting green, Peter was just making everything. He was just, I don't know if he always has these days or if he was just having a really, really solid day on the putting green, but it was just one of those things where everything looked really simple. Like all of his putts were like, oh, of course it went in because you just did it the way you needed to every single time. Mm -hmm. Randy, you kind of went over your round a bit. Was there anything you wanted to add to it? No, I don't need to go in into depth. But now that I'm actually looking at the board again, it's like we, me and Kat, so like, you know, the, the matchups are in order and me and Kat definitely had a few errors. We were down so much so early. We kind of took the gas pedal off, so we might have been able to take maybe two strokes better. But basically, we couldn't have beaten anyone that was left at the point, And that did catch me off guard. Like during matchups, I was like, oh, I'm on there playing, you know, guy, guy with Kat. And we basically took the last available matchup that we maybe had a chance against. And Tyler Gannon. The cannon. Yeah, and and he was a cannon that day, and uh, and Florida man, Jeremy, uh, Florida man, forehand million or something like that. 
Yeah, and they, they had a hot round. We pretty much had no shot, and that was just kind of a matchup blunder. Not sure how I would have redone it if I started at the beginning again, but yeah, me and Kat just, just played our game. It was really windy with me being the only one throwing a lot of the tee shots, at least on like the front nine. A lot of those holes with no tournament OB, it's just pure power. Without the high grass being out of bounds, there's no risk on a lot of the shots. So I would just go first. And if I threw it over 400 feet, Kat did not even take a disc out of her bag because there was no advantage to her throwing those shots. And even some of the upshots require a lot of power. So it was it was a pretty significant disadvantage on that course. If it was something like SPW or Stony Kill, me and Kat can definitely shoot semi-equivalent scores to the men's matchups but uh no just didn't work out unfortunately with all that being said though you guys were up three after one and like jason kind of alluded to it it came down to one because taking that one out they had five matches you had three Mm -hmm. and that would have i can't do the math off the top of my head but a potential four point swing with the was it justin f and doug i is that doug ionen yeah, it should be. Yep, Justin Fry and, and Doug Iannon. Against Justin... Uh, Justin Metis and, and Dan Agner. Mm. Yeah, they were pretty evenly matched. I think pretty much everyone above them on the board, so half of the board came down to basically single strokes. It was very tight matchups. It really could have gone either way. Well, looking at it, I only see one. Well, never mind. It's the one that you played in, but that's <laughs> the only <laughs> one that is... Yeah. That's, and that's still only six strokes, but everything else, like you're saying, I see... Oh, one hole playoff, two strokes, one stroke, one stroke, three hole playoff, three strokes, two strokes, and then four strokes. So yeah, no, it was very close, but they got 12 points to your six and gave them the win at 19.5 to 16.5. What's your next match? Next match is Burbine coming to Mindkill. And if my calendar is correct, that's the ninth? That sounds right. I don't have a calendar. The ninth is the second Saturday. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So half the podcast doesn't have a win. Thanks, guys. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> so um, you guys ready for a quiz? No, we're, we're not doing a quiz tonight. <laughs> we're finishing up with some team challenge. I'm trying to figure out where our next match should be. I think I want to save J Park Chatham Hill because I hear there's some controversy. I was in a controversy, but I think I would agree. I think, you know, like I think it's a good one to save for last. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Saratoga played Wilcox. How did you feel going in? I felt fine going in. We're a pretty strong team, you know, just in general. And at home, I think we can do pretty well. So I felt good. You guys were undefeated last year, right? Yeah, a 9-0 and if you count the matches and finals, you know, each is a separate match. I don't know about these guys, but I do. Who are your team captain or captains? So we've got two. Travis is rolling over from last year, Travis Bouchore. And Nick Terrell Lavoro just took over for Dylan Johansson, who unfortunately retired due to a shoulder injury he's dealing with. Oh. So he didn't think he could play this season. Hope to have oh, wow. him back at some point. But yeah, so Nick's taken over for us. And I think he's doing a pretty good job so far. We'll be the judge of that at the end of the year. But I guess so. (laughs) Who did you play and how did that go? So I got matched up against Parker Cerrone the first round. And I was on a card with Zach McDonald and he was playing Brandon Medina. So Parker and I, I think it was probably one of the closest matches of the day, just in terms of rating in general, where I think we're pretty close to each other in skill level. So he got off to a rough start. So I think I was up two after three on him. And then we just started trading. I made some stupid mistakes. I started three putting a couple times. Classic JP Hafner stuff. (laughs) Missed a couple birdie putts, some opportunities to get up on him. So it was pretty close the whole time. And it ended up coming down to the last two holes. We were even. So this was hole five of Wilcox, which is that short little downhill part three we played the main 18 red the first round and i got a little lucky through the right side but made a nice little 25 footer for birdie to go one up with one hole to go which i was able to lay up and push that match so zach won his match as well on my card four and three i believe coming Mm -hmm. in we were feeling good but the score was actually pretty close i think it was 10 to 8 after the first round, which surprised me. I thought we would do better than that. 
I don't know if that's just, you know, first match nerves. We've got a few new people. We picked up Max Horowitz. Nick Warren is now a permanent member. We've got AJ Gulak down from the Beacon area. And we picked up Jacob Driscoll as well. So just, you know, feeling things out for the first match of the season. So being 10-8, I believe we had to win five of our matches the second round to just straight out win and not go into any playoff. And we did that. I think the overall score after round two was 22 to 14, which Mm -hmm. is, you know, again, closer than I thought it would be being a home match. Corey did pick Saratoga as one of his final four teams. Yeah, they're good. They're good, I guess. But, you know, we're, you know, the defending champs at home, you know. And at home, I understand. I should have done a little better than that. But we got it. The second round, I was paired with Travis Bouchore. How many aces were there? (laughs) There were none from Travis, but there was the first round, an ace from Todd Martin on hole 11, which we played the shorts, so. That's actually a relatively new hole. It was a combined hole for a little bit, red and blue. But I, I think Todd's the second or third ace on that hole now. Okay. Travis didn't have any, though. Mm. And quite the opposite. Travis and I play terribly together. <laughs> and uh, we've known this. And so I don't know why we got paired together, but we squeaked out the win over Bobby Hallam and then Austin D. I don't know his last name, but I, I think we only shot something like six down. Yeah, we just don't mesh together. We get along just fine, but our disc golf game, we probably should each be shooting six down on the layout that we played singles, and we're doing that in doubles together. We played the South Hatchet in back nine for doubles with a few blues mixed in just to spice things up a little bit. But I uh, I told Nick and Travis, never again, don't put me with Travis. I think last year at finals, CTK, we prepared together. I think we only shot one down. We did not win that match. It was actually pretty awful. But yeah, we, we squeaked it out. So that's what matters, I guess. You play for Wilcox. How often do you get to play that course? Is it your home course? Yeah, I, I live 10 minutes from there. So mm-hmm. not as much as you'd think. Wilcox doesn't have the biggest community outside of events. So if you want to play with people, if you want to play sanctioned events or you know other events, then you drive a little bit. So I'll go south to Wedge. I'll go up to Discap Territory, over to Connecticut. I'll hit up Beacon every once in a while. So I play it. It probably averages out to like once a week. It's not terribly often considering how close I live. Taking Wilcox out of the equation, what would you consider your home course? In terms of most played... Mm-hmm. I'd probably say FDR, which gets a little weird. I'm on the Stony Killers for New England Team Challenge, so I almost know the wedge team better than I do my own team. So that's always a fun match. I think I've only ever seen you mostly at FDR, so I was actually surprised when Alex said you were on their team. Yeah, it's my fourth year with them, mm. which Travis actually picked me up four years ago. But you just don't like playing with them. <laughs> uh, I, I never said that. Never said that. I'm teasing. You just don't mesh well. So you guys were up, like you said, 10 eight after one. I'm going to ask you about the spread. It's kind of biased, I understand. but I'm not the best guy to ask. I wouldn't call myself a picky eater, but I don't actually eat much in between rounds. I don't eat much at all during tournaments either. I pretty much play on an empty stomach the whole time. But I know the highlight, and I heard this from a few people, there was like this chicken pot pie with nochi i think is how you say it Ganache. and that was however you, it's like g-n-o in the yeah whatever <laughs> whatever no i don't know it's Damon. too fancy <laughs> too fancy but i i know that was a big hit among everybody one of our teammates always brings these i think they're like five foot long subs which got demolished <laughs> And I'm not much of a cook, so I, uh, I'm i your classic Duncan bringer, which is a little boring. But You know what? Every team needs a Duncan bringer. I guess. <laughs> it's getting expensive. I need to, I need to start <laughs> cooking. Cooking is just as expensive. Right? So you guys were up by two after one, but then you got 12 to six in the second. Yeah. Again, we had to win five to outright win it in the second round. And I think we won six of them, six out of the nine. Mm -hmm. So ended up going, I think it was 22 to 14. Who you got next? I don't know who we have next. You're coming to Chatham. Ooh. Okay. So you know what? I'll I'll do fine there. I'm pretty sure Mm -hmm. most of our team feels comfortable there. That's the furthest south besides Wilcox. So that's the course that we're most familiar with as a team. Awesome. All right. Our next match, we got the North at the Tower of Power. 
Before we begin, I want to point out, winner of the neatest whiteboard, congratulations on that. I will pass along your praise to Mr. Parsley. Ah, okay. No one touches the board but Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to point out negatives, Kevin, but last year it was a clean sweep. You didn't win a match, right? We were last year, but it was our first year. No, I understand. Listen, we were really looking and, and hopeful and we thought that we would get this and we did, but we like to have fun. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only so many really good disc golf players, even in the big disc cap area. You know, there was a, seven teams before us last year and a lot of those guys are all on good teams. So absolutely. We're like the Tampa Bay Rays, I guess, you know. They're horrible, but <laughs> um, who are your captains for your team? Officially, our captains are myself and Evan. Mm-hmm. Tim Goyette is our third head. Okay. It's a very high head. It's like Alex High. Tim was going to be the co-captain this year with me, but just to make it official, we were worried about with Clay Missioner sending out the form and everything, making it official, and there's only two of us. But his son's now involved in a bunch of Cub Scout activities and things like that. So we made Evan the official co-captain. But it's the three of us, really. Who was captains last year? Myself and Evan. Okay, so you got like a year of experience. And I think that's important in Team Challenge. Yes, it is. Randy pointed out earlier, I think. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we were a little concerned because Mitt wasn't going to be there for for the match play. Talking about like Mitt Romney? No, no. Tim Goyette's nickname on the team is Mitt. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you for clearing and clarifying. No, no. I didn't know you had a Utah senator on your team, but did you play first round? I did not. I did not play at all on Saturday. Okay. Well, how did the matchups go? The matchups went, I think, really, really well. Wait, wait. You didn't play at all in round one or you didn't play at all on Saturday? I did not play at all on Saturday. Saving all your energy for the Stonewall Classic the next day. I see. Correct. I see. Okay. So what was the thought process going into round one? We were a home team, so the you know, we could throw first or defer. We chose to throw first. I think our strength on our team is the middle of our group of guys. Our middle is pretty solid. The top end of the middle it has actually risen to be more like part of the top end of our team guys now. Last year, we went from maybe we had two guys that threw over 900. And this season, we probably have four to six guys that are throwing 900 right now. Basically, the same guys, same team. We've picked up a few new players. The Darlings, understandably so. I mean, they were commuting up from central New York area for all the home matches. And they got to be a little bit much. So we've lost them. So we picked up a couple of local guys and I think we've strengthened ourselves. I mean, as Greg Kurtz told me at Disc Beat the week before, he says like all your guys are younger, kind of newer to the game and they're on the upward trajectory on their, their progression and growth. And uh, we reap the benefit of that this weekend. Was there a thought process as far as layouts for round one and round two? Yeah, we changed it up a little bit this year. We've played whites again for the match play. It's a little bit more technical, I guess. A little different. Something that, you know, a lot of guys, especially, you know, the team from the north, I mean, these guys probably haven't played Wallace a whole lot. How far is that area from SPW? I think you just told me that it would take me like an hour and five, an hour and ten minutes to get to their course. Okay. So, you know, it's a substantial distance. Absolutely. Who does the matchups when you're out there? Tim normally is most of the brains behind the matchups and the stuff like that. But um, we've got a little process that we may have stolen from Mr. Potts. One of the few times mm-hmm. that somebody else was around the same height as him. and we You got one of those charts? You might say something like that. Did you mess up any of the color coding? No, I didn't. Okay, that's good. Because I didn't make the table. <laughs> <laughs> Tim did. Tim makes the table. Yeah, so we got that in. We've got a little bit of a strategy that we use and to see how poke and pride. And mm-hmm. The thing I'm probably the proudest and happiest about is that we had, I would say, four or five stars for that match. Guys that you would think chances are they're not going to win the match. And then they pulled it out. They win it. I mean, and won convincingly. And every one of them was important. We were only up by a point after the yeah, first Yeah, nine round. and a half to eight and a half. Yep. We thought that all along. We thought we had a chance to win, but we knew or thought and believed that it was going to be a battle and it was probably going to be really close. 
And we had some matchups. I mean, you throw or you respond. So there were a couple of matchups that we threw that didn't work out so well. There were a couple of matchups that we responded to that worked out really well. That's one thing I've learned just listening to captains talk on this podcast. I can't tell you how many times Jack or Jason or Jamin have said, like, I put out so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so thinking they were going to win it. And then so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so actually did win, but the first three didn't. So, right. Yeah. It's a mind game. It is. And I think the whites too, I mean, it kind of helped us and maybe hurt us a little bit too, because while it's maybe a little bit more technical or a little bit more, the quality of the guys are probably not used to throwing white. Mm -hmm. They're not used to throwing those shorter distances, but it also allows individuals like myself, you know, lower end of the guy of the scale guys that, you know, you could pop off a good round. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even if it's a 200 foot shot, if you've never played it, you're not exactly sure where to land. Obviously, you know where to land, but like you don't know how to get there. And mm-hmm. some people played it a bunch can. So, no, it makes sense. Yep. Did you guys do breakfast like you did last year? No. Sparky was our breakfast guy last year, and he, he switched over to something else on the spread this year. So we just kind of just did the donuts and coffee thing from Dunkin' or Stewart's or whatever routine. Don't that. just say just the Dunkin'. Donuts and coffee are still great in the morning. Nobody's going <laughs> to complain about that. They were. I came with my own coffee prepared from home and whatever. So so you're up one after one. What was the thought going into round two? So you guys kind of touched on it a little bit. We really kind of take into consideration vibe cards. You know, what's the vibe of the team going to be? You know, when we try to match up good putters with somebody who can throw for distance, but maybe isn't as good putting. We try to put all those factors into account. And uh, we've got a couple of set. I mean, obviously, Camel Case, Corey. That's just a given. Those, pretty much those two guys are always going to play together. That's uh, Brian Monahan and Tim Goyette. Two halves of the Camel Case, right? Mm. A perfect example of vibe card. They play really, really well together is Evan Parsley and Eric Struna. Those guys just pick each other up every time. They're like, somebody has a bad shot. Somebody's a little bit off. I mean, like, they get into each other's heads. They really know how to work well together. And, I mean, they were the second hottest round of the day in dubs. Now, in singles, you played the shorts. Did you play the brewski or the longs in round two? Last year, we played brewski bowl. Mm -hmm. This year, we decided at least for that match, because the guys have been bugging me. like They wanted to play blues. They want to play blues. They want to play blues. So we decided we play blues this month. So the men played blues. The ladies played whites. And the one mix card, the ladies played from the white tees and the men played from the blues tees. Okay. And took best shot from wherever that may be. So you had nine matches. See. It looks like there was one tie. We didn't discover it until they've been sitting around for a while. Evan Lloyd and Nick Esposito and then Joe Polsoni and Sean C. G. I think he's from Vermont. We realized after they've been sitting around for a while that, oh, you guys tied? We don't have ties. Pretty much everybody had been wrapping up. So they went back out. We just went out to one blue and they started a playoff. And they played one, played two, played three, played four. They finished four and they were still pushing, pushing. I mean, it was just tied, 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 tied. So at that point in time, they were kind of talking and I I got on the phone and I just called back over to the pavilion and asked Evan, I was like, what's the status of the score on the board? I mean, these guys, they've just finished four holes and it's still tied. And he's like, well, we had already won. Mm -hmm. At that point, we were up 10-6 for dubs. So we had already won the match. So we talked to the two cards and everything and we're like, it was getting later in Mm -hmm. the evening. It was really windy. I mean, I heard somebody else say that it was really windy at their match that day. So, but I mean, it was really windy on Wallace. A couple of the people from North came down the week before and like, oh, we were here last Sunday and it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. It was, you know, no wind whatsoever. We had no idea that this course played so windy. So I saw the wind do stuff on hole four at Wallace that I've never seen before. Just pushing the discs everywhere. So, you know, at that point in time, we were heading into yet another windy hole, hole five. And we're like, well, if we won, you know, it's not going to change much of anything anyway. Other until I thought about it really probably later, it might impact somehow percentage points. Mm-hmm. 
that you won because we just decided we'd call it a tie. Worst case scenario, if, if it means going into finals, you just have them match up again and keep playing. We'll come back and start at hole five, I guess. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the hottest round of the dubs round was none other than Camel Case Corey in their matchup with Eamon and Jacob from the north. That is Tim Goyette and Brian Monahan. They shot a 47. Nice job, guys. So final result, Tower of Power 20 and a half and the North 15 and a half. And the Tower of Power didn't even have Jason Gorsage. No, we did not have Jason Gorsage. He is on the wrenches. The Tower of Power wasn't even on the Tower of Power. And your first win. Our first win. Yeah. That's awesome. So we'll see. Hopefully we have another one in us. But next month is Saratoga. All right. At Saratoga. So we shall see. Well, congratulations on your first win. We greatly appreciate it. And I want to thank all the hosts that had faith in us. Mm. Sorry, Corey and Alex. It's 10 o'clock. We're done. (laughs) So our last matchup of the week, Jay Park at Chatham Hill. Who wants to start? I guess we'll start with matchups. So I should go first. Oh, because Corey doesn't do matchup. No, I don't. I'm just a player. So start off with the semi controversy, whatever you want to call it. We were rolling 14 and two on the day, which is, you know, not ideal to say the least. What's normal? You're supposed to have 15 and three. So 15 guys, three ladies. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have the three ladies on the roster and then one on the reserve and our reserve and one of the people on the roster couldn't make it as well as four or five of the guys on the roster and reserve couldn't make it. So rolling with 14 and two, despite having, you know, a potential 20 people that could have made it. So it's a little bit frustrating, especially when you know you have this day. Like it's a set day, you know, it's the first one. Yeah, no, I get you. It is the first one. And there there was a I want to say there was an A tier or, you know, a high level tournament in Connecticut. But yeah, it happens. Still a little bit frustrating, especially when you see the results. Luckily, we had the the clay missioner on site playing for the wrenches. So she was able to figure out exactly what the penalty was supposed to be. As I understand it, I think the wrenches were short one or two players in round one. So it, it ended up being, you know, slightly offset there. But that's how it goes. So it was myself and uh, Mark Ox. We've been captains of the of Chatham Hills forever. Jay Park picked up two new captains this year with Brian Bickersmith and Chad Larson. So they were learning the ropes, getting things all together there. I think we were able to use our experience with matchups to get a couple of more favorable setups, especially in doubles. It ended up they had a very strong team left and we had a not as strong team left. So it ended up, you know, quote unquote, wasting their their strong pairing there, which helped us out. But, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. So going into singles, things went relatively smoothly. Nothing too crazy. You know, we knew we were going to have to go for some longer shots when it comes to matchups just based off of ratings, points, differentials. But a lot of our players stepped up. Some of the lower rated players have gotten a lot better in the offseason, quote unquote offseason, the summer, Hmm. and put up a really good showing. So we can't really complain there. I ended up on a card with Robbie Hendricks on our team. I was playing against Chris Dahl and Robbie was playing against Mr. Corey Cook. I actually requested to play against Alex. I thought I'd been really juicy content if I was <laughs> able to like beat him at his home course. And then and almost immediately after saying that, I'm like, wait, this could really backfire on <laughs> <laughs> so playing against the MA1 player? Yeah, no. I, I, yeah, I could it could have really backfired. I'm just <laughs> saying Corey beat me twice last year, so I mean maybe I didn't want that thing this time. <laughs> No, they threw Chris Dahl and Chris Dahl's a great guy. I love playing with him. And I knew I had a chance to beat him. That was one of the ones where I felt like I could take a couple of steps up. You know, he's 20 ish points ahead of me in ratings. So Mm, at your home course. Yeah. And at my own course, I feel like I can take that step up and we kind of need to have some players take that step up. So I went for that one. Robbie is a relatively newer player but really impressed me at doubles a couple years back, weekly doubles at Stony Kill. So we invited him to play and he played really well that day. I'll let Corey go into that a little bit more. But my round was pretty smooth, nothing too crazy. Did you start on hole 10? We did start on hole 10. And, um, you know, it, it ended up coming down to, so really early on, so hole 11, our second hole, I have like a 10 foot putt to push the hole. I was a downhill putt. I hit slightly high and left. And it splashes out and I lose the hole there. And at the end, I was back one with one hole left to play. 
and ended up losing it. So like if if I had come into that even, you know, if I had made that, you know, 10 footer that I easily should have made, then, you know, it throws everything off. You play the hole entirely differently. basically. Yeah, you play it very differently because I was I was playing that whole it was whole nine hours. Our last hole playing super aggressive, you know, trying to get something crazy because he was set up for a birdie and, you know, ended up losing it. But, you know, it, like it was two up. But, you know, realistically, if I had been playing that hole the way I would regularly play it, it probably only would have been one up. But but GG to uh, to Chris. He played really well. You know, I clawed my way back from a couple holes back, but uh, he was able to hold out on me. Corey, you want to get into into things? Uh, yeah. So I was playing up against Robbie, which it's kind of funny. I feel like I see him more at kickball throughout the year than I do at disc golf events. But you know, one of the first things, I, I, like on paper, I should be beating him 99 times out of 100. And uh, he kind of joked around in the beginning, like, oh, you know, it should be an easy day for you, whatever. Which did not turn out to be the case. I don't know what the hell it is with New York <laughs> Team Challenge. <laughs> but so Stony Kill was pretty windy that day. Oh, gosh, it, it was it was a gorgeous day, like 60s and sunny and like 30 miles. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty <laughs> nuts. So my match with Robbie was actually pretty interesting. There was very few holes that like we pushed. We were just kind of going back and forth throughout the whole round. We started on hole 10, hole 11 I take because he basically takes a loss disc penalty and just like concedes the hole. When we get to hole 12, we end up finding his disc that we gave up looking for on hole 11. And then he beats me on hole 12. I get him on hole 13. He gets me on 14. He gets me on 14 C. Hole 15. I, you know, I tried to, I tried to like play this smartly and like, okay, if the guy has a bad shot, just you know, don't do anything crazy that you might end up bogeying the hole too or whatever. Just kind of play smart. So you know, he goes OB on 15. So I try to play that one smart and get the hole on him. Then from about there, I started having really bad issues with just like my throw. Like every hole from there on out, I was letting go left and early and i just i just struggled for just about the entire rest of the round except for hole 18 which i don't think i've ever done it before but i ended up throwing in for an eagle which was cool because it it got me a win on the hole but it was still only worth one point (laughs) (laughs) it was a hell of a shot great drive and then you know dead on second shot you know you like couldn't have drawn it up and i I couldn't see the basket i was like halfway up the hill you try to get up uh down the fairway and i just like i I had to do like a little baby flex with a forehand my toro and out of my hand i thought i threw it too high or too hard so as I like jog up the hill to watch where it goes, I just watch it this hunting dead center chains and it's stuck. But yeah, so from there, I mean, we go literally into like the second to last hole and I was back to with two holes to play, eight and nine. I throw a hole eight, I get a big skip. I'm probably like 30 feet away from the basket. Robbie throws his shot. He gets kind of like the anti-skip that puts him maybe 15 feet from the basket. Meanwhile, the entire round, he's been putting lights out. I guess that's what he's known for is being a really good putter, which it showed. I hit my 30 foot putt or so for the two and he ends up like caging his whatever it was 15 or 20 feet. So now I'm back one with one to go. Hole nine is a tunnel, slight dog leg left, but the basket finishes on the right side of the fairway. And the goal is to just throw down the tunnel. You know, uh, you don't have to go very far, especially if you have a serviceable forehand. Like the second shot is pretty simple. And I blast it right into the rough on the right side. Robbie was able to have a, I forget exactly how good it was, but it was kind of like good enough. It was, it was a good shot. I'm sitting in the woods trying to figure out how I'm even going to get out of this this predicament I put myself in. Decide the only, I, I can't birdie from here. So the only thing I can do is to pitch out horizontally, have a good forehand to the basket, take a par, and hope that that's good enough. And actually, I lied. Once we got to hole eight, I was only back one. So I, I took hole seven and eight. So anyways, I had to basically push our last hole to, to push the round. So that's what we did. Felt bad to not win that match, but at least it wasn't a loss. That, that, that's basically it. I, I yeah. definitely should have won that match. <laughs> and it, 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 it was a little distasteful to, to come back to the parking lot without it, but it was better than a loss, I guess. So after round one, it's eight and a half to eight because of a half penalty point against Chatham. Yeah. So because it was 14 and two, there were only 16 points available. And then that half point 
penalty because we were short two players, but they were also short a player for the morning, but they weren't short a player for the afternoon. It ended up being half a point. However, it worked out for the first round. Wait, didn't we get the half a point because Caitlin played a man? You know, I genuinely don't know. I was under the impression that Kate was playing as a guy in this situation, like this season in general. But I have stopped trying to keep track of how the penalty points worked out. We had Kate on site. She knew what she was doing. I trusted she was doing it right. Oh, yeah. Mm. I, I'm, uh, I guess that's kind of what I thought the case was. We'll have her in the future and we'll get <laughs> more specific. Sure, sure. But as of right now, according to the second best board <laughs> in New York Team Challenge, it's eight and a half to eight. Yeah. Real quick note, really proud of the team. Put up a really good fight. A lot of one ups and, and two ups and, you know, really close battles. You know, we have to put up a bunch of 50 50s, especially when we've got a team that were outmatched on paper and uh, we won a good chunk of them, which is always a good feeling. Corey, you are the only unbiased, unbiased opinion of the night for the spread. How did that go? I thought it was good. It wasn't like a over the top spread, but it had all the heavy hitters. Uh, it had two coolers that had PBRs in them because mm-hmm. it wasn't that much communication between the Chatham Hills team. And one guy didn't know if the other guys bring a PBR, but. In the end, I think we're all winners when that happens. Am I right, brother? I mean, come on. (laughs) (laughs) Can't complain. Can't complain. Um, There were some other beers in there, too. But yeah, no, usually Ryan Kendrick, who is a stony killer now, brings his hot, spicy balls, whatever he calls them. But apparently we... Chocolate salty ball? Yeah. Apparently apparently (laughs) this time we had Mark Ox's balls, which were... You know, those were good. Before we get to round two, did Mike Schwartz go to anybody's spread? He showed up at ours. Nice. (laughs) He showed up at ours. Clipboard and all. Actually, Evan actually invited him. Made a point of inviting him to come check us out. And he's like, well, now I'm not going to come now because now your spread will just be over the top because you know I'm coming. And Evan's like, our spread is always over the top. So round two. All right, round two. We're going into it knowing that we need five out of eight. 14 and two, so eight total pairings out there. 16 points available. And, you know, they're they're up by a little bit. But we got to win just over half in order to win overall. You're putting together teams. Anytime you're responding to another team, you know you're going to get a pretty favored matchup. So we know we're going to have four that we're going to be in pretty good shape. When you're doing matchups, are you considering penalty points at this point? Oh, yeah, definitely thinking about it because because we know we're down by a little bit. Okay. That half point is mattering at this point. And we knew that it was only going to be one additional point for the afternoon. So it didn't end up changing anything. The penalty points didn't affect how many matches we needed to win in doubles. Okay. So we knew we were going to have four matches we were responding and hopefully you're going to have good matchups with. And for that, we were going to be thrown blind and they were probably going to have good matchups in. So put out four solid teams and we put out four teams that we hoped could could steal a win. And uh, unfortunately, weren't quite able to get there to spoil things a little bit, keep things moving. This was another one where the new captains, Chad and Brian, ran into a little bit of an issue where they had a really strong pairing of Chad and Jay Gorsage, who ended up shooting the hot round of 46 as their last, you know, matchup. And we had a couple of lower level players that, you know, that's that's not the situation you're looking for. Jay Park had the tower of power? Jay Park had the tower of power. Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Dubs player extraordinaire. Dubs player extraordinaire. Yeah. I got the rematch against Chris Dahl. This time, bringing along my, you know, classic partner, Sam Richter. Started off very strong. You know, started on 10 again. Both part 10. But then we got a birdie on 11. I got the solo bird there, feeling really good. Made a long putt on 12 to get the birdie there. So we're up two. Kept things even through 13 and 14. And then we both stayed in bounds and got a birdie on 14C. And they took a bogey after both going OB with the super high wins. Not super surprising, but still a two point swing at that point. It was still really early, but it gave us a, I want to say four strokes of lead going into, you know, the last two thirds of the match. And that's always a tough place to be fighting back from. So we were able to relatively cruise, you know, played well, but cruise into a win on that one. How'd you do, Corey? Uh, Yeah, I played with uh, Adam Nelson against two of the three Ryans on the Sony Kill team. Should that be illegal, like having that many Ryans on one team? I feel like they should have more, or that they do have more. Yeah, so we have four Ryans. <laughs> four <laughs> Ryans, two Joes, two Robs. We have lots of the Literally same no names. diversity in the Chatham Hills team. Mm-hmm. We only had three Ryans to play 
this week, but we got to figure out a way to pick up Ryan Nelson as well. So we can have five. Ryans. <laughs> so what were the Ryans you played for? Uh, Ryan Yadow and Ryan Jeske. They're kind of a classic couple. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, our round, we kind of pulled a early lead against these guys. I think like by the time we got halfway through, we were already up three or four strokes. Probably. Not, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It was just, we kind of just, it was a nice enjoyable time. Like for myself and Adam, like, like I said, we had a, an early lead. So we were able to just kind of coast. I mean, we still played well and put up a decent score. I think, I think like probably the third lowest score of the doubles matches. Yeah. Chad and Jay put up a 46, then Sam and I put up a 47, and then there were a couple 49s. Yeah, so we were one of the 49s. I can't remember if anything too crazy happened. Uh, well, okay, well, actually, the one thing to talk about is new for this year is like live scoring for New York Team Challenge doubles matches on UDISC. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Brian put together that event. Yeah. yeah created the league in, in UDISC, and then we have the events for the different courses. You can watch everybody else's scores as you're playing. Yeah, so while we were playing, we knew, myself and Adam, we knew that we were basically tied or up half a point going into round two and you know, basically knew that we had to win at least half the matches. So knowing that we didn't have to like focus as much on our match, we were kind of keeping an eye on, on the leaderboards. And the entire time we were concerned based on what we were seeing that this is going to come down to the, I think there was two matches that people were not doing in UDIS. So we had no idea what, what was going on with those. Yeah. I think one of those was uh, Greg Kurtz, whoever he was playing with. Him not doing UDIS? That's shocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Greg, Greg and Robbie versus Justin Muccelli and Austin Sword Out was one of them. Did they use paper or did they just mark the trees as they went by? <laughs> <laughs> they, I think they used counting pebbles. Oh, fair yeah, enough. Right? But, you know, Greg plays really well at Stony Kill. I mean, I'm pretty sure. What, did he have the hot round during singles at the scramble? Or maybe it was during doubles? I want to say the flex, he shot like a 7 or, maybe, yeah, or maybe something like that, which is really mm-hmm. high. It, it was it was a really good score at some point very recently. So not seeing Greg Kurt on the new disc leaderboard was a little scary, you know, not knowing what he was doing out there. So I don't know if we were one of the last cards come in, but there was definitely people hanging out by the time we came back. And it was the general sense that we had ended up clutching it up. Yeah, you, you were the second to last ones to come in if i remember correctly and we had some report from justin as he walked through from 18 to 1 that they were up by a couple of strokes or something like that yeah so overall it was a mighty fine day to be a wrench (laughs) we went to chatham we uh we we torqued them down and (laughs) lefty loosely right tidied it (laughs) yeah it was a good match you know played them to a draw As Randy had alluded to a while back, if we had Andrew Dorrell, then things might have changed a little bit. You know, it would have been less penalty points, would have been a potential win in singles, potential win in doubles. Is that who you knew last week wasn't going to be there? Yeah, that was Mm -hmm. the thing. I knew he wasn't going to be there because he was, I want to say he was playing a tournament. I think he was at that A tier in Norbrook Norbrook. over in Connecticut. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But. You know, we also had however many other people on our on our roster reserve that also couldn't make it. So there's no blame in any one person for this. But yeah, we played really well. Still played you guys to a draw. It was the penalty points that that pushed you over the edge. So without penalty points, round one singles is eight eight, doubles is eight eight, but it's a half yep. a penalty point in round one and a full penalty point in round two. Yep. And we're not even considering the fact that Caitlin Clay played a dude and won. Yeah, Kate was planning to play uh, guy matching for this season, so that that is going to keep happening. Mm. I think that was one of her stipulations, right? To be on mm. J Park is yeah, play against. She's like, I, if I got to play with Corey, I'm playing a dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's fair. All right, so seventeen and a half to sixteen. Yep, we got Wilcox coming to Stony Kill next, so we'll see how that one goes. <laughs> Who you got, Corey? Um. You got to buy a month. Jay Park has a buy next month. All right. That's right. Nice. I just want to throw out the standings, our pick standings. Randy oh, yeah. was two and two this week. Mm-hmm. The same as Caitlin Clay. They were both two and two. Alex, Jamin, and Jason were all three and one. But Corey Cook, four and oh <laughs> in his picks. And yeah. and successfully called the Mind Kill CPS match. That's part of getting them on, Corey. That's, no, 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 no. that's how you get four. No, up, I, I, I went <laughs> one step further. And I said, I'm pretty sure I said it was going to be close in round one, but that CPS was going to come back and win it in double. Pat, 
I, I wanted to say he said it, they were going to be up three, which is we'll what hear they the were. clip. Oh, really? <laughs> He's going to put the clip in. Clip All right, this yeah. is where I'll put the clip in. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll right. be surprised on Friday. Last week on the Hudson Valley Disc Golf Podcast. I'm going to go CPS with a come from behind victory after being down three and a half points after round one. Write that down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hear that audio clip again. I was going to say, we got, we got it audio. After round one, mind kill was up ten and a half to seven and a half. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, anything else before we go? Flex the beginning of next month. Oh, the volunteer flex? Volunteer flex at Jay Park at the beginning of next month, and then Turkey Throwdown, which is full already. There's oh. FDR Ghouls Fest coming up, but I think that's full. Yeah. MVP Space Race at Jenkinsville, November 16th. We're a couple weeks out from that, but... There's a space race at Port Jervis, but I think they're pretty full as well. So thanks, Alex, Corey, Randy, Jason, Kevin, Jamin, and John. And uh, thanks, guys, for coming on. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Thanks, Pat. Pat. And uh, sweet up, Hudson. Thanks, Pat. (laughs) (laughs) I got somebody with their alarm going off in my background. So (laughs) this one person, they just never, it's not, very common, but it's like, do people use car alarms anymore? Let's be real. Because <laughs> I mean, well, look at my reaction. Not worth it. Is, is my reaction to run to the phone, call 911, this person's <laughs> car is being broken into. No. It just means you got a car that's got one of those really old car alarms on it. I mean, mine went off yesterday morning, right before uh, check-in, I think. So. Oh, that was you? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I almost fell asleep. I got there a little early and uh, checked in and I just sat in the warm car and car alarm went off. So, yeah. Good news, this one just turned off. So... crap everybody's timely i was there's no still only one out um <laughs> it's just with the way they got beat yesterday this is a big one it doesn't matter what the score was yesterday as long as you win one in los angeles that's it that's all we gotta do is win could have been one nothing i don't care mm. my stomach would have cared but i wouldn't have i'd have been stressing out much more what all right somebody talk about something for a few minutes Corey's flatlining i'm not flat i'm here kevin I'm, i feel better <laughs> okay. than you did off of those uh nine benadryls you took the other day <laughs> this golf tournament it was three <laughs> there we go all right yeah got there yeah struck him out of course had to get runners on because that's diaz uh, yeah. it wouldn't be diaz otherwise